All praise to Allah, the one true God of Abraham, who we know as Ibrahim Islam, and all the Prophets, especially the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Now, the reason I've set up this dialogue, slash debate, whatever you want to call it, between these two guys is, Carlton, for example, is somebody I've known for six years, and he's a very nice guy. We spend so much time debating with some of these deranged evangelicals, some of them who hate Islam so much that they cross-dress for some reason these days. And um, if the Christians are watching this video, they know who the cross-dressing missionaries are. This is why I like for, from time to time setting up debates with decent people, decent representatives of Christianity, and I feel that Carlton is one of them. So, the topic tonight is, is Jesus God? And representing the Muslim side, who will go first, is Brother Hamza. Brother Hamza Mayat embraced Islam 15 years ago. He's one of the regulars that attends Hyde Park Speaker's Corner. This is actually his first moderated debate, so hopefully Carlton will take it easy on him. Representing the Christian side is Carlton, uh, Carlton McDonald. He's been a Christian for 35 years, since the age of 20, and has engaged in a few dialogues with Muslims, such as Dr. Sh um, Shabia Ali and um, Brother Sadat Anwar and Adnan Rashid as well. He believes the Bible is the word of God and particularly likes to focus on prophecy. He respects Muslims and Islam and sees believers in the Creator as brothers. The, the format will be as follows. 20 minute, uh, up to 20 minutes opening statements, then 10 minutes first rebuttals, 5 minutes second rebuttals, and then there will be a 10 minute crossfire period where both sides will get 5 minutes each to basically um, question the other side. After, the, uh, after that, we will break up for Maghrib and for some food. And then we will um, commence the q and A. I'll I'll gi I'll give the format for the Q&A at the time. One last thing before they start is I'd just like to say Jazakallah here to Brother Tasni from for the Brother allowing us to use these premises. So um, with that, you can start now. Okay. Shakandai. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. And peace be with you, Carlton. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, as Brother Zakir said, um, I'm an English revert to Islam. I embraced Islam 15 years ago. Um, originally I was an atheist and from there I became an agnostic where I believed in a creator. And, and then from there obviously I became a Muslim. Um, I'd like to thank Zakir here for arranging the debate, mashallah, giving my first foray into this kind of field and hopefully it's the first of many, inshallah. Also, I'd like to thank Carlton for being my first guinea pig with regard to this, to see um, how I can basically handle myself at this level. Anyhow, the title of the debate is, Is Jesus God? Uh, now before I continue, I'm going to be reading a lot because I've not memorised this. So, as I said, I'm not used to this kind of format, so I want to make sure I get everything out there. So I might be looking at the paper most of the time, listen to the words I'm saying, rather than concentrating on how I'm doing it. Okay. So the question, Is Jesus God? Now we need to understand um, the question before we can answer it. So what do we mean by God? Now there are many different understandings of the word God. So it's important to know what we're talking about so we can test the claim fairly without creating any straw men definitions. So by this word, I'm referring to an almighty creator who is all-powerful, all-knowing. The type of creator an agnostic may concede exists. May not go as far as believing in religion, but they'll accept that there must be something and it must be all-powerful and it must be all-knowing to have created everything that exists. These are also some of the attributes of God that we will find in the Bible as well. So now we can understand what is meant by God, we can now try and answer the question. Is Jesus an all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the heavens and, heavens and earth, who guided the prophets of the past, gave them power to perform miracles, the one who told Noah to build an ark, the one who told Abraham to circumcise himself and to sacrifice his son, the one who helped Moses rescue the children of Israel from the Pharaoh, the one who put Jesus in the womb of Mary, so this is the question we're asking. So now before I try to unravel this question, I need to tell you the method I'll be using. First of all, I've come to know that not all Christians believe the same thing when it comes to Jesus, who he was, even if they belong to the same denomination, there are still differences. Now from the little knowledge I have of Carlton, now I'd be honest with you, this was a few years ago I watched his debate, 
He seems to believe in things which would be heresy according to the teachings of mainstream Orthodox Christianity. And uh, back in the day he would have been burned at the stake for such a heresy. So today I'm not here to debate heretical beliefs. I'm here to address the claims of mainstream Orthodox Christianity. If I'm wrong about Carlton and he doesn't subscribe to any heresy, then that's great as I'll be, I will be directly addressing him and his beliefs as well. Now, another thing. For this debate, I'll not be approaching it from an Islamic angle as I see no point in trying to use Islamic sources to determine this claim, when those sources are not accepted by mainstream Orthodox Christianity as reliable or valid. So I will not be appealing to the Qur'an, Hadith, or any Islamic school of thought to support my position with regards to this claim. In fact, for the purpose of this debate, I'm going to forget the fact I'm even a Muslim. I'm going to go back in time 15 years to when I was an agnostic. Now the reason I'm doing this are twofold. The first reason, I don't want to look at this through preconceived biased glasses trying to fit Jesus into my world view as a Muslim. Second, and for me this is more interesting, because after I became a Muslim, I met Christians. And when I told them I embraced Islam, they said to me, you only became a Muslim because they got to you first. That if, if, if we Christians got to you first, you would have become a Christian, but because they got to you, you became a Muslim. Because once you were agnostic, we would have just shown you the truth, which is Jesus died for your sins and Jesus is God. Now for that to happen, I would need to accept Jesus is God. And so here we are, an agnostic testing this claim is Jesus God. Now I warn you guys, back then I was a pure logical intellectual tip and thus that is how I'm approaching this, pure logic. Yeah, no emotion here, no hocus pocus here, no smoke and mirrors here, pure logic, simple logic. So how can I test this claim? Well first I need to know about Jesus and who he was, what he said and what people said about him. So what sources could I use to find the information I need? Well, one thing is for sure, secular history isn't going to help me as according to historians. There's nothing written about Jesus and his miracles anywhere outside of the Bible that will remotely help this claim. So that's a pointless exercise. So the only thing we have left to test the claim is the Bible. So let's look at the Bible and let's see if we can find uh, this claim in there. Well, the Bible split into two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, is there anything in the Old Testament that can help us? Well, as far as I have seen, Jesus isn't mentioned by name in the Old Testament. There is, however, prophecies of a Messiah that the Jews were waiting for. Also, it is pretty clear from the Old Testament that God is an all-powerful, all-knowing and has no partners. We read this in Isaiah 45, 5. I am the Lord, there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me. There is nothing here to indicate that this Messiah will be this one God. So now we have seen the Old Testament can't help the claim. We're only left with what? The New Testament. Now before we do this, we need to try and establish which Bible version should be relied upon. As we know, there are many different versions. Some claiming verses have been removed wrongly, whilst others claiming words have been put into the mouth of Jesus he may never have said. Now, I know Carlton here loves the KJV. Not sure why. Um, <laughs> I think it's because he thinks that you can't prove there's fabricated verses within it because nothing is removed. And maybe he can tell us that when he um, presents. Anyhow, the New Testament. Now, this is made up of the supposed letters of Paul, the supposed epistles of the apostles, Acts of the Apostles, and four different versions of the prophetic life of Jesus, and of course a dream at the end. So which of these sources of, uh, can help our claim? Well, the supposed letters of Paul cannot help us, as he himself never met Jesus. He never sat with him, he never ate with him, he never travelled with him, he never heard any of his parables, nor witnessed any of his miracles. He claims to have met Jesus on the road to Damascus, but I would ask the question, how would he have known who he was talking to? For me, his supposed letters cannot help the claim. Now we come to Acts of the Apostles, or as it seems, the Acts of Paul. Now for me, this is a dubious source, as its supposed author Luke is also somebody who never walked with Jesus. He seems to focus most of his book on Paul and his teachings and adventures. Although it does contain some accounts of the chosen disciples of Jesus, and thus those could be looked at and examined too, if they support that Jesus is the one God here in the flesh. The epistles could also be looked at, although there's a question mark over their authorship. The dream at the end cannot be verified. From what I have read, the writing styles of Revelations and that of the Gospel of John um, are different. So this indicates they're not written by the same person. 
So finally, after stripping everything else away, we're left with the four different versions of the prophetic life of Jesus, also known as the four Gospels. Now, even within these Gospels, there are problems. First thing, they're anonymous. None of the authors disclose their identity. So we, we, we don't even know if they were the ones there present, eyewitnesses. We don't know this. That's the first problem we have. Now, the first three Gospels, Mark, Matthew and Luke, are also known as Synoptic Gospels. Now, they all seem to tell the story in roughly the same way, with a few minor details changed. It's thought that the anonymous authors of Luke and Matthew copied much of their work from the anonymous author of Mark, as well as taking extra verses from the mysterious Q source of which there is no trace. If you read the verses found in these Gospels, you will see Jesus evolving from a prophet to something more spectacular. For example, when Peter is asked in Mark 8, 29, who do you say I am? He replies, you're the Messiah. Jesus responds, don't tell anyone about this. Now in Matthew 16, 16, the same question is asked. Peter responds this time, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Then Jesus says, flesh and blood have not revealed this, but my father in heaven. So we see now the author of Matthew is embellished. He's added extra words now. Mark never said son of the living God. Now we have extra words from Matthew. Another example is in Mark 5.30 where Jesus is touched by someone in the crowd and he felt power drain and he asked, who touched my clothes? This is showing a lack of knowledge. In Matthew 9, he has no need now to ask who touched him. In the same incident, he turns and he knows whoever she is and he says, why did you touch me? So the lack of knowledge has now been removed. So we can see this evolution occurring. Now a final example how Jesus wasn't all-knowing and all-powerful, and again another example of this evolution, is in Mark 11:12 12 we find the story of the fig tree. It goes like this. Jesus was hungry after travelling from Bethany. He saw a fig tree in leaf in the distance. He went to see if he could find anything to eat. When he came to it, all he found was leaves, because it wasn't the season for figs. Jesus then purses, curses this poor innocent tree that had done nothing more than follow its creator's will, saying, may nobody eat of your fruit again. The next morning, whilst passing the tree, Peter saw the fig tree dried up from the roots and told Jesus about it. Jesus responds by saying, faith in God can do more than that. It's as if he's proud of what he's done. He's saying, yeah, we've done the tree, don't worry about that. If you have faith in God, you can move a mountain. So there was no remorse for the tree, yeah, it's done. Okay, now in Matthew 21, 19, we find subtle differences. Instead of the fig tree being in the distance, it's now on the roadside, meaning Jesus didn't traipse across to get to this tree, realizing there was nothing there. It's been reduced for him now, so it just happened to be next to him. Second thing, the reason why there was no figs on the tree is also removed. So in Mark, where we know there was no figs because why? It wasn't the season for figs. Matthew now has removed that. So now the tree has no excuse for not having figs. Also, the miracle is instant. When Jesus curses the tree in Matthew, it withers immediately. Whereas in Mark, it's the next day it withers. So we can see Mark's embellishing again. Now, the other thing we should also be noted here, the actual incident of the fig tree. Now, according to Matthew, Jesus cursed the tree after driving the money changers out of the temple. You know, when he overturned the tables. Um, anyhow, in Mark... He, um, while in Mark, he carries, uh, sorry, whilst in Mark, it is before he carries out that assault. So there's a difference here. We've got a chronological problem now. This is supposed to be historical eyewitness uh, testimony according to Christian sources. Now we find the event is actually taking place at different times. So this is something else for us to look at. The story highlights the fact, though, that Jesus was not all-knowing because he didn't know there was no figs on the tree. It shows he wasn't powerful, because why, if he is God, make the figs grow, make bananas grow, forget figs, yeah? And why, why uh, question, his judgment is called into question when he destroys a perfectly healthy tree. So these are things to consider when you're trying to say that Jesus is an all-powerful God walking on earth. Even the young girl he heals is exaggerated. In Mark, the girl is sick. In Matthew, she's already dead. So we can look more at problems with the Gospel of Matthew later and its exaggerations. Now we come to the fourth Gospel. The Gospel named John is another anonymously written book. Now this appears to be a completely different animal to the first three Gospels. According to Bible scholars, there are three different authors involved with it. Now I'm pretty sure this is going to be the main source of Calton's claims. 
Anyhow, for the purpose of debate, I will not challenge the authorship for now, and I'll treat it with the same amount of merit that Orthodox Christianity gives to it, although I will, of course, question interpretation. So there we have it. I've narrowed down the source of which the claim can be fully tested, the four versions of the ministry of Jesus of which contain the supposed teachings of Jesus. Now the first question to ask, did Jesus, make himself, did Jesus himself make a claim that he is God? Or did he show distinction between himself and God? Well a simple answer is, no he didn't. If you read the verses found in the Gospels, it's clear that he is not making such a claim. Second question, did he demonstrate to the people he was God in the flesh? Did he demonstrate an all-knowing capacity? Did he demonstrate an all-powerful capacity? What is it that gave Orthodox Christians the belief that Jesus walking on the earth was God? From what I can see there is nothing. Also, a further problem is now created, as we know from these Gospels that Jesus prayed to God, begged God to be saved from the cross, cried out to God whilst on said cross, never claimed any power, was his own, always, never claimed any power was his own, giving recognition to God the one who sent him. So now the question needs to be asked, how can God be Jesus as well as be the one being prayed to, etc? Because if there is only one God, then your claim is that Jesus is God, which means God is Jesus. So now I've established where we should find the reasons for this claim, Let's hear the claim and the reasons for it. Thank you. Okay, good evening everyone and um, welcome to our dialogue or debate. Uh, the title is, Is Jesus God? And I too want to thank everyone for, for being here for those who've organized it and arranged it. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, I've not got the lead to my projector. So although it's really important you understand the words that I'm going to share from the Bible in order to answer the question, is Jesus God? I'll have to read them for you carefully. In fact, I've got them on um, my laptop. And if I give Honorable Zach the Bible, he can check that uh, every word I say is exactly as it appears in the Bible. Okay, so... <clears throat> okay, now my, my first slide is really uh, a question. What was given to Isa? And um, unlike uh, Hamza, who isn't going to refer to uh, the books the Bible or the Quran, I am going to refer to uh, those books because I think they are important basis for faith. Uh, our logic isn't always logical. So, um, Surah 2, Ayah 136, the Quran says, Say, we believe in Allah and in that which had been revealed to us, Muslims, and in that which was revealed to Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq and Yaqub and the tribes, and in that which was given to Musa and Isa, and in that which was given to the prophets from their Lord, we do not make any distinction between any of them, and to him, Allah, do we submit. So, the Quran says that um, Allah and the prophets make no distinction between the Quran and the Bible. The Quran, let's say that again, the Quran says there is no distinction between them. Why is that important? Well, uh, in Surah 2 verse 136, it says, we believe in Allah and in that which has been revealed to us, and in that which is revealed to, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm going through the same slides. So there is no distinction. Tell me, I'll, I'll press the button. Yeah. Me, so here, here's my question. Should I believe the Quran or what people say about the Quran? Thank you. Uh, I think I should believe the Quran. The Quran says there's no distinction. There's a longer answer than that, though. Brother. Oh, oh, carry on. <clears throat> Thank you. Should I believe the uh, Imams and the scholars? Should I believe Zakir Naik or Ahmed Didat? Um, or should I believe the Quran or what I read in the Quran? Should I believe the Bible? Yeah, press that one. Thanks. 
You see, um, Ahmed Didat, who started the Islamic Research Centre just on Coventry Road, not too far from here. I'm from Birmingham, actually. I grew up in Allen Rock um, as, a, as a little child. <laughs> so I know this area better than most of you. Um, <clears throat> so it doesn't matter how eloquent these guys are, it has to be important for Muslims to read the Quran and to understand the Quran. Um, you see, many of the arguments that we hear from a lot of the uh, young quality guys originated with Ahmed Didat. But surely the Quran must take priority over them all. And if it is the words of God and a person reads that and they see one thing in the Quran and they hear something else, I say they should prioritize what they see in the Quran. And if there is a disagreement, surely the Quran should take priority over that. I'm a Christian, and for me, the final authority in matters of belief is the Bible. I know the Quran says there is no distinction, but the scholar says these aren't the originals. So my question is, which version did the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, which versions of the Bible, Old and New Testaments, did he have? I'm told repeatedly that what we have now aren't the originals. So where are the originals? If Allah gave these, then... He hasn't given them very well because they're lost. That seems to make no sense to me. So, um, <clears throat> if Muhammad couldn't read or write Arabic, uh, and yet the Quran um, says that he uh, verified no distinction between the Quran and the Bible, Old and New Testaments, it means that what we have, which is what the Jews uh, used, in the time of Muhammad, and Christians have used, although it was in Greek uh, and uh, Latin, we can be confident that what we read in the Bible is what was verified by the Quran. Thank you. Now, so let's get to the particular topic. Is Jesus God? And it's a very important question, uh, and my answer is going to sound uh, a little strange. So my answer is... It depends when you ask the question. Okay, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> if you ask the question today, is Jesus God, then according to the Bible, the answer is yes. If you ask the question 2,000 years ago, while he walked upon the earth, there is no doubt he was not Almighty God. He was a man. Uh, and if you ask the question 3,000 years ago and earlier, the answer is yes. He was God, uh, according to the Bible. So, 3,000 years ago, before he became a human being on earth, he was God, the creator, the almighty God. After his ascension, and we'll have a look at these verses in, in a while, um, he was the creator, almighty God again. But let's start with the Old Testament. We're going to look at the book of uh, Ezekiel. Yeah, we'll, we'll, you want me to, or we just no, trust you? You have to trust me on, on this, this Old Testament one. It's the New Testament one that will be controversial. So, in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 24, um, Ezekiel saw a number of different beings, and then verse 24 says, When they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of an host. When they stood, they let down their wings. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber. What color is amber? Orange, gold. As the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and it had the brightness round about. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of, uh, in the, the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that means Jehovah. So it looked like Jehovah. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. So Ezekiel sees a vision and he recognizes from what he sees in the vision that this is Almighty God and he bows down. 
we will see those terms again in the New Testament referring to Jesus. So, 3,000 years ago, Ezekiel saw uh, Almighty God, Jehovah. Today, so in order to talk about what Jesus is like today, we're going to the book of Revelation. It's called Revelation because verse 1 says it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. You want to know what Jesus Christ is like? You read the book of Revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, we're going to read chapter 1. And in chapter 1, we'll find that Jesus is the Lord, the Alpha and the Omega, the Almighty God. So we'll start with verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. Verse two, 3. And it says, Blessed is he that reads, that hears, and understand. So you want to be blessed, you want to be happy, you want to be uh, knowledgeable, read the book of Revelation, hear the book of Revelation, and understand the book of Revelation. That's the revelation of Jesus Christ. The starting point to understand the nature of Christ is the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Next slide. Now, in verse 5, it, it makes it clear that Jesus is alive. He's the Savior. He's the Lord, the Alpha and the Omega, the Almighty God. So let me read verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the Prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7. Jesus is coming again. Verse 7 says, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Jesus Christ is coming again. Every eye will see him, and they also which pierced him, those who crucified him, they are going to be raised and see him come back again. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Why will they wail? Why will they cry? Why will they be really unhappy when Christ comes again? Because they're not expecting him. They don't believe in him. And as a consequence, they're not following his way of life. It will be a terrible and sad time. And it finishes verse um, 7 by saying, even though they're going to wail because of him, amen. In other words, so let it be. Because although it will be a sad time, Many people have had an opportunity to hear about Jesus, to read about Jesus, to understand what his mission was, but they haven't taken it up. But this world cannot continue as it has been with all the terrible things that are happening. It has to come to an end sometime. And when it comes to an end, if people aren't ready, that's the beginning of a new creation, a new life with all this madness gone. Verse 8. And this is the key verse now. Verse 8 says... I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Now, those need to know who's saying them. So far, we don't know, but let me read the words again. Alpha and Omega, beginning and the ending, the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, which is present, which was past, which is to come future, eternal. And it finishes by saying in verse 8, the Almighty. Who's speaking? We're going to find out. So verse 9, John says, um, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in the tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos in the Greek islands for the word of God. He was exiled from his home to the island uh, and he was there for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, the Sabbath day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Ezekiel heard a voice, very, very loud voice. John says he heard a voice behind him like a trumpet, really loud. Verse 11, again, the voice said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, what you see right in a book. So he heard the voice behind him. Now, if you hear a very loud voice, um, often you'll turn and look and see what's going on. So what John saw in the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ are the events leading up to the end of the world. I'm telling you a little bit about the book of Revelation. Those um, prophecies in the book of Revelation are symbolic. They take study, prayerful study, to understand. And the things that we see happening today are foretold in the book of Revelation. 
the mark of the beast, the eternal life and the conditions that uh, we need to receive eternal life. Um, we need to stop. Um, we need to stop and think why John was in exile uh, for um, the word of God, for explaining the word of God, for sharing what he saw Jesus Christ do. Nobody wants you to know these things. And although I haven't got time to go into it, verse 8, all the modern Bibles, all the modern Bibles, to answer your question as to why I prefer the King James, all the modern Bibles take out uh, the Alpha and the Omega uh, and the Almighty in verse 8 because we're now going to see who it is who's talking. So verse 12 of Revelation chapter 1, John says, I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the middle of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. So here's the voice, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, uh, the Almighty, the first and the last. And he sees, and because he walked the roads of Jerusalem with Jesus and Bethlehem, he recognized who it was. And this is the Son of um, Man who is speaking and saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the, the first and the last. Now I believe what the Bible says. His head and his hairs were white like wool and as white as snow and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Remember what Ezekiel saw? Fire all about and his feet like unto fine brass as if burned in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Hebrews 4 verse 12, next slide, um, explains that the Bible or the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. Out of the, the voice that was behind him, out of... Uh, out of Jesus' mouth comes a, uh, something that sharpens the two-edged sword. It's the Word. John chapter 1, verse 1, you all know it. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was nothing made that was made. So, this is consistent. Jesus has the word of God coming out of his mouth, sharper than a two-edged sword. He is um, the same person who in John chapter 1 is described as the word, being with God, being God. And all things were made by the word, were made by Jesus. And he's making that clear to John now as he tells John about the future. Um, yes, just let me see. Uh, so, Revelation um, finishes by saying that Jesus says, I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and death. In other words, Christ died as a human being, raised back to life. He will now live forever. Before he became a human being, he was the beginning. All things were made by him. Nothing exists in the universe that wasn't made by Jesus Christ. He became a human being. He lived as a human being, uh, and then after he died and resurrected and went back to heaven, he is now the Almighty God. And he comes to John, letting John know what's going to happen in the future, and he introduces himself as the Almighty God. So, do you want to live forever? Only he that was in heaven has come down and lived on earth and knows what it is to uh, be a human being can judge you fairly. And that's what Jesus did. So he's our saviour, he's our mediator. And when he became a human being, he lived on earth, he died on earth, he rose again. No doubt he was a human being. In John 17 verse 5, in his prayer, he says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Thank you very much. Before the world was. So in that prayer, you know verse 3 very well of John 17. But that prayer, he says, give me the glory that I had before the world was. What you love is the, verse, the two verses before that, which I'll read for you. John 17, verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the Father, the only true God. No doubt about it. And life eternal, know the Father and Jesus Christ, whom the Father has sent. What you like is know the Father, you don't like, and Jesus Christ. And he says, verse 4 of John 17, I've glorified thee on earth, I have finished the work which you gave me to do, and in verse 5, give me the glory I had before I came. Why don't we read verse 5 as well? So, there is no doubt in my mind that Jesus Christ is Almighty God. All things were made by him. 
when he lived on earth, he cannot be God because he's a man. He's just like you and I. And so, in order to be like you and I, many Christians say that um, Jesus, when he walked on earth, was um, God and man. Well, are we God and men? Because uh, in Hebrews chapter 5, it says he was made just like us. So, if he was God and man, as most Christians say, and we aren't God and men, then he can't be just like us. He was born of a woman, he was a human being, and he lived just like us. So most of the reasons why um, you, my Muslim brothers, brothers get uh, upset is that you only focus on his time on earth. No doubt about it, he was a human being, 100%. But he existed before, and he exists after for all time. Thank you very much. That's in nature, because I'm trying to pull from here, there and everywhere to try and respond to that. Uh, no, don't worry, don't worry. I'm gonna, I don't mind picking stuff up. Again, don't, don't watch my mannerisms and what I'm reading, picking up, dropping down. Listen to the words, please. Yes, fine. Okay. In my original opening statement, I said I'm not approaching this from an Islamic point of view. The reason being is I want to know why a Christian believes Jesus is God from what he reads in his Bible. Now, Carlton can try and shift it to the Quran, saying, oh, you should believe the Bible. Well, this is exactly what we're doing. We're showing you the Bible. We're opening the Bible. We're asking you why you believe that Bible, even if that Bible was the one with Muhammad Sallallahu Even if it was, we're still questioning it now. So that's the whole point of it. That's the whole point. I spent 15 minutes stripping away the Old Testament, we question the letters of Paul and such, and even the dream, I, I, you know, the dream revelations at the end, John, I explained how the two different Johns, according to Bible scholars, are not the same due to the writing style. Now, Carlton there tried to make the John of the dream be the John who walked with Jesus, and I'm assuming the one who wrote the epistles of John. Okay, now he made such a a beautiful fantasy about these revelations. Yeah, I thought he was going to read from Lord of the Rings next. Yeah, it was dra dra there's dragons and all sorts in revelations. You didn't need to stop with just simple, uh, you know, what you did. It's a dream. There's no way to verify a subjective dream. What you need to do is come from your scripture, come from Jesus. He chose 12 men to walk with him, listen to their testimony. Did they think he was Jesus? You admitted. No, Jesus wasn't God, he was a man. So you've actually conceded the point. So according to the only source that we have is the New Testament, is the Gospels, you're saying when Jesus walked on the earth, he was a man. So why would anyone think he was God? Nobody would think he was God. But Christians today think he is God. Now here's the question, if people of the time who walked with Jesus didn't think he was God, why do you think he's God? This is the question that needs to be answered. Now, the problem Christians have, and like I said, I, I mean, again, Carlson went into a bit of heretical beliefs again. Jesus was God, then, then John transformed to a man, and was fully man, then transformed. This is heresy. I think it's Nestorianism or something like that. And this is why I said I don't want to deal with heretical beliefs. I want to deal with mainstream Christianity. So, what Christians do... They look for this ambiguity. They look for things, that, oh, this, this could be God, this son of man. And, I mean, there's verses in the Bible which speak about the son of man as being equal to a worm. Man is a maggot and the son of man is equal to a worm. This is not divine. This is not God. So I don't know why they appeal to this son of man idea as if it proves some kind of divinity. The Alpha and the Omega. What do they think that proves? This is again coming from a dream. What they're trying to say is that, oh, because it's pre-existence and always existed, but no. Because we know there are other personalities in the Bible, not part of the Trinity, who pre-existed and were everlasting and had no um, lineage. We know this as well. Now, what I want to ask the Christians, because there's not much to rebut from what he just said, to be honest with you. I was a bit... Um, I thought it would be a bit stronger than that. I didn't know he was going to bank on one man's dream and that's it. And then we have to accept the dream and that means it's the truth. Ignore what Jesus did walking on the earth. Just go to the dream and, you know, dream what you like. Come on, man. I say, what did I say at the beginning? Logic. What does logic mean? Reason, understanding, intellect, reflection, contemplation. No emotions. Not Nothing to suit what you want it to suit. To squeeze this dragons with seven heads and this and that. Oh, yeah, that's a sudden. Yeah, we've seen the sin of a man pointing through. Come on, man. Anyway, why do you ignore explicit teachings of Jesus? Why, why do you ignore them? For example, in the 
version of Jesus' life according to John. Chapter 17, verse 3. I'll start with 17. Jesus spoke to these words, lifted up his eyes to the heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. So now we've got a two-way conversation going on here. As you have given him authority over all flesh, so he's been received authority. So he, he, has no, he doesn't have his own authority. He needs to receive authority. That he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this eternal life, that they may know that you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Why do you ignore that? Is that not explicit? Is that not Jesus saying you're the only true God? Now, if you're saying there's more than one God, then make that case. That isn't a problem. Then we can deal with that as well. But right now, your stance says if you think Jesus is God, then he is God talking to God. What's going on here? And the God he's talking to has the authority, has the power, gives the permissions. Okay. So there's no co-equals going on here. So I, I don't get it. I don't see what you're doing here. Now, that beautiful verse that Jesus says there is the verse I quoted originally from Isaiah 45. Can I find it now, like? One second. What did Isaiah say in 45? Oh, I can't find it right now. Maybe I'll get that in the next rebuttal. Okay. Now he talks about Ezekiel. Ezekiel recognizes the vision. He, another vision. One man's having a dream. Yeah, this was this was this was God. Another man's having a vision. Yeah, this is God. And then he's marrying the two. Did you notice? You notice the heads there, and you notice the tails there. Come on. How did Ezekiel know he was seeing God? We we thought no man can see God and live. What's going on here? How can Ezekiel see God? If this isn't truly his God. Um, King James. You like the King James because it doesn't remove verses. Logic, my friend. Why did the King James, uh, why were the verses removed from modern Bibles? Because it's very simple. The King James is based on late manuscripts. It's based on 5th, 6th century manuscripts. Now, this was written in the 16th century before the discovery of the Codex Sinaiticus, which is older manuscripts. And what they found in the Codex Sinaiticus is that there were certain verses missing that were found in the later manuscripts. So they realised these were later additions. So the reason he can't find the verses he craves to support his argument, because they're not there. Which means Jesus never said these words, or these, these things never, never happened, and they were just fabricated later on. This is why he liked the King James. Now, there's a, there's a funny... Oh, okay. And, and I was looking at something in the, the King James Bible where, in the King James Bible, it refers to Jesus being the Son of God. In the New King James Version of the Bible, it says, Servant of God. So now we've got Son of God, Servant of God being used intermittently. Again, what's going on here? Why are you ignoring explicit verses and favouring dreams and visions? It, it, for me, it doesn't make sense logically. How can a dream of one man on an island somewhere supersede the ministry of Jesus walking on the earth, preaching and teaching parables and miracles, and one dream supersedes the lot? So nowhere in this walking and talking and preaching and teaching does he mention that he's God or he, he will be God again and he was God before nowhere does he mention this and now you're claiming oh forget that forget what he taught forget the 12 disciples he chose to walk with him and, and educate them and teach them all things and such yes. forget that we just go to this dream and this supersedes everything so basically all Carlton did in his presentation was Jesus is God because this dream says he is No hocus pocus or emotion or faith. Thank you. Okay, ready? Thanks. Right, uh, some of um, Hamza's first questions I'll address first. Is Jesus the one who put Jesus in Mary? Um, obviously not. It's a, it's a good question. But it fails to recognise that Christians say that in the very first chapter of the Bible, the very first verse of the Bible, it begins by saying, um, 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the word for God there is Elohim. And when Elohim says, let us make man in our own image, when the spirit moves upon the face of the deep, um, and so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, that there isn't just the Father who's doing the creation, but it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So, clearly, uh, and the prayer was um, that, give me the glory that I had before. Um, so, Jesus is the Son of God. He came from the Father, not from himself. So, um, I'm surprised that you're using logic like that when you must know that the Christian's position is there are three of them. And I've had to waste a minute on that. Um, <clears throat> Isaiah 44 verse 6, since you wanted to talk about Isaiah. Um, Isaiah 44 verse 6. Isaiah says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the Lord of hosts. So the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. So there are two Jehovah's in the Isaiah that you're using. So, uh, you know, it's useful to put all the verses together and arrive at a picture than to just uh, use one of them. Um, why the King James Version? I don't really want to say this, but I spent seven years of my life researching why the King James Version is the best. I've written a book on the topic. I can't cover it in 27 seconds. Um, but I don't really, really want to say this. I know what I'm talking about. I've done the research. And maybe we should have a, uh, a discussion into why modern versions, and then I can uh, give you the proper picture. So, Paul never met Jesus. In Acts chapter 9, verse 5, and it says... Um, when Paul was struck blind and he heard the voice, he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. So did Paul meet Jesus? According to Paul, he met him, didn't know who it was, asked the question, and what he saw um, answered and, and said, I am Jesus who you're fighting against. <laughs> We've got four Gospels and he, he made a lot about uh, Mark and Matthew. <clears throat> Now, uh, the reason why there are differences, he says, because these stories evolved. But actually, John Mark was someone who went on the missionary journey with Paul. John Mark did research by talking to primarily Peter to get Peter's story. So that's why Mark's gospel is the shortest gospel. He wasn't an eyewitness and neither was Luke, the physician, uh, an eyewitness. Um, and his is quite long. But Matthew was an eyewitness. So these embellishments aren't evolutions from um, Mark to Matthew. Matthew was an eyewitness. He wrote the full account. So when you read Matthew, you see the full account. When you see Mark, you see an abridgment. Um, Jesus destroys a perfectly normal tree. The purpose of destroying the normal tree is anyone who says they are a Muslim or a Christian or godly and does not bear godly fruit when he comes again. They may be good people, but they will be destroyed. And he's finished that parable by saying, learn the parable of the fig tree. All of us here, we say we're religious. We must bear fruit. Some of us bear fruit for the wrong reasons. When Christ comes again, if, if, if we're doing it for the wrong reasons or not doing it at all, we will be destroyed. Um, did Jesus claim to be God? Um, <clears throat> I've, I've already covered that. Uh, there are many people, many Christians who say that while Christ was on earth, uh, he was both God and man. Your logic could, should tell you that that's not possible. Um, <clears throat> now, um, in your last session, you referred to Revelation as um, like the Lord of the Rings. That is not at all respectful. God says when he's speaking to prophets, he gives them dreams and visions. Daniel chapter 2, a vision is given to King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel uh, 
sees the same vision. That vision says there'll be four world empires 2,600 years ago. So, since you don't think much of dreams, listen to this. Four world empires. The first one will be Babylon. Second one, Medo-Persia. Third one, Greece. The fourth one, Rome. And there wouldn't be a fifth world empire. A dream, he says, as if it's nothing. You do not recognize the power of the word of God, my friend. When God speaks to his people, he speaks through dreams and visions. And to disregard them, you do so at your peril. And you speak as if you have not learnt anything so you've, since you've become uh, a, 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 a believer. Because the logic you use is the logic that people who don't believe use. These aren't just dreams. And I could show you prophecy after prophecy, vision after vision, and you say, whoa. Because they aren't just dreams. Do not disregard them. Three and a half minutes left. Um, three and a half. Oh, excellent. I, th I thought it was about to run out. <clears throat> Um, so Numbers 12 verse 6, God said, hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. When he was walking the earth, he spoke in parables. And they said, why are you speaking parables? So that seeing and hearing you won't see and understand. He gives visions because those that really want to know what God is saying will study those visions. Those visions mean nothing to um, people are, in fact, Paul says, and I know you don't like Paul, but I'm going to read him anyway. He says that uh, the people of the world cannot understand the spiritual things of God. Um, uh, and now I, not even I can find this. <clears throat> okay, let me not uh, w w use up my time. <laughs> Um, so, God speaks to us in dreams and visions, and to not understand those visions as if you're a man on the street, and to then say that the Bible isn't the Word of God and nothing it says is true, to me makes no sense whatsoever. Um, so, I really hope that you will see that these visions of the Bible, these in fact, the reason I'm a Christian is because I, I grew up as a scientist, went to a grammar school, and when I saw two more than 2,000 prophecies of the Bible, and science has not disproved one of them. I thought, I need to look into that sort of evidence. And it's those prophecies of the Bible that convince me, no way can these dreams and visions about the future that we see happening today be just guesswork from people. They must be from God. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Um, I think uh, Carlton misunderstood what I said. I don't think I once said none of the prophecies in the Old Testament are true. I didn't say that. I didn't say dreams are not true. I didn't say that either. What I did say to you is how does a dream supersede a walking, talking Jesus with witnesses and chosen and miracles and parables and such? And he never makes this claim. And yet a dream later on, apparently you find the claim there. So my question wasn't the fact that, oh, dreams don't prophesize the future. I have no issue with that. That's not even the topic of debate here. The topic of debate is, is Jesus God? And you're saying a dream through all of this hocus pocus is actually, yeah, this is, this is the son of man. This is, this is God. Where I showed you, I stripped it away for you. I showed you where to look. I, I, I was like an arrow pointing to it. It's the Gospels. This is where Jesus should make such a claim. This is how people should know who he is. When I speak to Christians, they say, oh yeah, in John he says this. He says, I am the father of one and before Abraham was, I am. I hear all of these wonderful statements that they come out with. You've not even touched them. You've gone to a dream. So this is what I didn't understand about this. I wasn't challenging the idea of prophets having dreams. And understand one thing, John of Patmos wasn't a prophet. So his dreams don't count as prophecy, I don't believe. Anywho. Uh, you said um, Christians all believe that God is three. No, they don't. There are many Christians. I mean, you act like from the time Jesus left this earth, everybody was in agreement that Jesus was part of a trinity and the Holy Spirit was part of a trinity and they were all co-equal making up God. This is not true. This is like 300, 400 years later for this doctrine to be created of the Holy Spirit to be actually become co-equal also. There were Christians burning at the stake for refusing to accept this idea. Even in the 16th, 17th century, a, a guy, Michael Servetus, was burned at the stake for writing a book against the divinity of Jesus. So it's no wonder today Christians are in the minority with regards to this because they were burned for believing otherwise. And why did the church burn this guy? They burnt him with his book tied to his belt. And this is what they said at his trial. 
This is a warning to anybody who comes along trying to make such a claim. So th this idea that God was always three and it's unky dory and everyone believed in this trinity is false. So please don't try and present that. Um, now you say John Mark is Peter. Where'd you get that from? No, no, no. John Mark consulted Peter. Consulted Peter. So what we're saying now is he's trying to imply that Mark wasn't an eyewitness, but what he wrote was from what Peter told him. Now the problem he has with that, the most important part of Christianity is the resurrection. Without a resurrection, there is no Christianity, according to Paul, who he does like. Now, we look in the Gospel of Mark, in the original, oldest, reliable manuscripts, and there is no resurrection experience according to the Gospel of Mark. Now, I thought this Mark is supposed to be Peter. Now, according to the Gospel of John, John and Peter raced to the tomb, and then they had such wonderful experience with Jesus appearing to them and telling them this and telling them that. And yet, in Mark, now remember something. When Jesus passed or left this earth, yeah, for 40 years there was no gospel. There was no story. So imagine for 40 years no one was believing in a, this birth. No one was believing in this resurrection. There was, no, there was nothing. And then Mark writes his gospel. No virgin birth. No resurrection. For 10 years we wait for Matthew to write his gospel. Now if you want to talk about Matthew and the qualities he has. Well we know he creates earthquakes where nobody else records it. So you can say Matthew does the full account. Well no one else records an earthquake. No one in secular history records an earthquake. No one else records the dead rising from the graves and entering all the towns. We know Mark, Matthew embellishes. It's clear. One minute left. Okay. So that's Matthew um, under the bus. Um, yeah, I'm going to go back to my uh, appointment. You, could, you just clearly missed because you went to the very first verse of the Bible. It says that God was working with something. Can I remind you? This is Isaiah. I am the Lord. There is no other apart from me. There is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me. In Isaiah, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor there will be no one after me. I, even I, am the Lord. Without me, there is no saviour. It's explicit, and you ignore it for trying to make this and that mean that and this. Don't understand it, mate. Missed the point. Because it's after his resurrection, the question is, is, not was, you've addressed the was while he was on earth. I'm not talking about 2,000 years ago. So my statement was, it depends when you ask the question. You don't seem to have interacted with that. So... Is he? According to the book of Revelation, he is. Now let's talk about some prophecies. In the book of Revelation, since John is not a prophet, uh, it talks about there being worldwide religion, a beast that forces worship, that no one will be able to buy or sell. You see all the things that are happening to Islam now? It's because there is a system that the book of Revelation describes that will have one world religion. You guys get in the way of that. And so that one world religion, the religion they want isn't Islam. And so they will make Islam look bad. They will kill Muslims and make it look like, oh, we're actually doing something good to save everyone else. These things are all prophesied in the Bible. You need to read the Bible to understand what's happening to Islam around the world. You think we're surprised. When I first came to the, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, they were saying this in 1981. I now see them coming true. John's not a prophet. You just need to understand the prophecies. Thank you. Right, now, how long was it after Muhammad's death that the Quran was compiled? Oh, okay, I, th I thought it was 12. 12, 15 years. His question was, there were no Gospels after Christ ascended to heaven. That's not true. But, um, yeah, yeah. It was compiled straight away by the oh. sec second caliph, Abu Bakr. Was yeah, you said... Uh, you, the, the the question, this, uh, sorry, uh, can you stop the clock, please? Um, are, you, are you interacting now? Because you're going down the wrong road yeah, there. Because yeah, the, 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 the Quran yeah. was revealed from the angel Gabriel yeah. to the messenger Muhammad, yeah. through memory. 
Exactly. It was yeah, preserved like, through yeah. memory, never once. Yes. Yes. When you're talking about... Brother, 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 relax. Yeah, go on. Yeah, 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 just finish your afternoon. We've got a mother episode. Yeah, just... He needs to finish the point. Yeah. 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 My point is, no Gospels were written for 40 years. He said, nobody believed it. Does it matter when the Quran is written and made available pe to people uh, when people start to believe? Did they not believe it while he was alive and during its uh, distribution throughout um, uh, Arabia? Of course they did. So, you know, what kind of logic are you using that no one believed it because nothing was written? I, I really don't understand um, <clears throat> the, the approach you're taking. The question, is Jesus God? Clearly he disagrees. It would be better if his disagreement was with the point I made. While on earth, even though this is heretical for many Christians, while on earth, the Bible makes it clear that he was not God. He was man. He was made in all points like unto us, other human beings. And so, because... All of the, the teachers are attacking um, Christians who want to defend that Christ was God even when he was on earth and died uh, and he's God afterwards. It, it, it's, it's a difficult argument to win when the reality is he became a human being to die uh, to save us from our sins so that we might have an opportunity for eternal life. It's important that we try to understand that. One minute left. Um, so let me just find the, the verse that I was trying to find earlier. I was looking at but didn't realise it was it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Um, it says, and then I will sit down. <clears throat> the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum everybody once again Okay, we're going to start the crossfire section And then it's going to be the Q&A The format's going to be in the following way Hamza's going to have five minutes to cross-examine Carlton And then we're going to switch it over vice versa Where Carlton cross-examines Hamza for five minutes Then it'll be the Q&A Where a person asks a question to whoever they want to ask it to, and then that person will get two minutes to respond, and then the other opposition will get one minute to respond. And the questions have to be, please, brief and straight to the point. No comments and no interruptions. Um, no matter what the answer is, please don't interrupt the speakers. So that way we can just keep it flowing. And um, if anybody can, try to have some questions for uh, this direction as well, not all towards um, Carlton. Let's try to keep it going circular. All right, then, so should we start it from now? Let's get the timer ready. Start. <coughs> yeah, uh, so, Carlton, um, I, I, re I mentioned earlier about your heretical beliefs. Uh, I wasn't quite sure about it. You seem to confirm you did have heretical beliefs. Um, I'm just wondering, what is, what is your belief and how you understand this idea of a trinity, if indeed you do? Okay. My beliefs are 100% based on the Bible. <clears throat> so, nowhere in Scripture does it mention trinity. So, do I believe in the Trinity? No. I don't believe in Trinity because Trinity means different things to different people. Catholics say that Mary is part of the Trinity. It's not in the Bible. <clears throat> the Bible does talk about Godhead. Jesus spoke about when you're baptised, baptised in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So, we recognise that those three individuals, according to Scripture, are part of a Godhead <clears throat> with different roles, different personalities, different... Um, uh, individual identities but working in total harmony so Genesis chapter 2 um, God said <clears throat> that uh, a man would leave his father and his mother and be joined unto his wife and they shall be one flesh father and mother or husband and wife being one flesh so when in the Shema uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 4 <clears throat> Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Echad, one Lord. It means that they are perfectly united like a husband. Sorry, sorry, this is cross when when um, they're perfectly united as a husband and wife ought okay. to be. You don't need to give, elaborate uh, so much. Just tell me what it, what it is rather okay. than tell me why what, you believe what it is. Okay. So you don't believe in um, that the Father, the Son and Holy Spirit are co-equal in one Godhead. Is that what you're saying? In one Godhead, co-equal? As one God. <clears throat> um, First Corinthians, yes no? First Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2 says the head of the woman is the man, the head of the man is Christ, the head of Christ is God. It's really important you hear what the Bible says, okay. not what Carlton okay. says. So 
Was that a yes or a no? You believe that the father and son? I'll, I'll tell you God. again. Just say yes or no. The head of the woman is, is the yes man. No? The head of the man is Christ. The head of Christ is God. I don't have any cryptic answers. Just if, answer the question. If, the head of Christ is God. Are a husband and wife? I'm asking a simple question. Can you answer the question? It's very do you, simple. Do you not understand? No, I don't. That's what I'm asking you. So you think a husband and wife are equal? No, I don't ask that question. I ask you, do right. you believe Jesus, the Son, and the Father, and the Holy time. Spirit? No, they're not the same. They're not the same. Okay. Correct. Now, according to you, you say the King James Bible is your source of reference. Correct. All right. So how do you understand 1 John 5, 7? Um, the uh, the Johannine comma, um, there is only one Greek manuscript with it. There are 400 Aramaic manuscripts that predate Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. And so, although there isn't much Greek authority for it, and Erasmus says, I will not include it in my Greek um, translation until you show me. How do you understand it? How do I understand it? Yeah. <coughs> um, okay, let me find it for you. It, it says... Two minutes left. First John 5. It says... Uh, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Right, so this is the Trinity, yeah? No, it's not the Trinity. Oh, it's not? I told you, a husband and wife are one, united. I said that the uh, Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, uh, our, the God is one Lord, oh, okay. Echad, united. But Echad is also used in Old <coughs> Testament for a yes. cow, uh, meaning one cow. So it's not, Echad doesn't necessarily have to mean more than one and one. Um, yes, it's true. So it can be used for both, yeah. So, yes. um, and Christians so, believe the Trinitarian belief is that Jesus, I'm not a Trinitarian. So no, you I know you're not. About I know you're not. But you believe in the King James Bible is inherent without error, and so in your Bible, which you believe is without error, it contains um, this particular verse, which has been refuted by most of the. As you I said, I just told you. I know. Yes, correct. I know. But it says there are three bear witness in heaven: the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Now you don't believe that. Now you said you believe. No, the, no, no. I believe one that they are way. one united. One minute left. One. Not one individual. Not united. one individual. Correct. So what does the Bible mean when it says that then? Just as united in purpose. <clears throat> a husband shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, they shall be one flesh. Mm. I've explained it several times. Right. It means that they are united. They are different uh, individuals with different roles, but united in their uh, overseeing of the universe. Right. So when Jesus, as you said earlier, is, is man walking here, what was Jesus prior to um, being born of a virgin? Um... Seconds. One of the Godhead. Which Godhead? There's only one Godhead. Right. So is this the God of the Old Testament? And the New. God and the New? Yes. Okay. So when this one of the God... See, this is what I'm saying. You say you don't believe in a Trinity. Now you're kind of describing a Trinity. Yes, because I, I, I described if, Godhead. If you're saying Jesus is God, yes? Yes. This is your claim, yes. of course. And um, in the New Testament, we know Jesus prayed to God. Yes. And there's only one God. Yes. The only way you can get around this <coughs> is the Trinity. Time. No, it isn't. It's we're we're going to switch you over now. Well, Sorry for cutting you, but we have to keep it within time. Uh, when you're ready, we'll press start. Okay. All right, uh, start. I'm, re <clears throat> I'm ready. Right, so, um, do you understand that after Jesus lived as a human being, he died, and according to the Quran, what happened to him? Okay, um, remember the purpose of the debate? I'm agnostic, you're supposed to be showing me from the uh, verses of the Bible. Why Jesus is the, the Jesus title, God? As I understood it, was, is Jesus God? Is Jesus God? Right. Uh, this is called All right, the, the Quran question says, The Quran says no. Jesus is not God. Uh, what was my question? Where did he go? He ascended. Yeah. <clears throat> ascended okay. to heaven. To heaven. Okay. Now, is there anyone else that has ascended to heaven? Uh, Elijah. Elijah. Yeah. Okay. Um, What's your point? Um, I'm asking the questions. I know. You had your five it's minutes. <clears throat> Um, okay, so my point is, he's in heaven, Elijah's in heaven, anyone else in heaven? Uh, the crowd said Enoch. 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 Okay, well, I, I don't understand the purpose of your question then. Yeah, well, you just answer the questions. What does this have to do with, is Jesus God? Because this uh, is the topic of the tonight. Uh, do, you so not want, do you not want to answer my question? I don't mind, but um, if you can get to the point. Yeah. Okay, uh, you had time to ask your questions. I'm getting to the point if you simply answer the questions. Yeah, but you wasted my time by elaborating on your answers. Okay. So I'm being sharp with you. Okay, that's cool. Okay. So, if he is not God, why is he in heaven? Um, he's not... Okay. Why is he in heaven if he's not God? Yeah. Are you saying no one's in heaven? No, I'm not saying he's... All right. No. So why is Elijah in heaven if he's not God? Um, because he was translated. Well, that has, what does that mean? <clears throat> it means he, he was taken to heaven without seeing death. Okay, is it, 
Okay. So Are Jesus is in heaven without seeing death. I don't see a point. Uh, the, the point is, <clears throat> is Jesus special? In what sense? Uh, he, is he uh, just a prophet? Yes. Uh, okay, so which other prophet is in heaven? Elijah. Um, <clears throat> okay. And uh, is Elijah the same as Jesus? In what sense? Uh, in that, according to Paul, Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. That means that he is the one with the authority. Elijah um, went to heaven on the uh, authority of the resurrection that Jesus Christ paid for him. What? Yeah, sorry, you, you don't understand this. No, 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 I don't understand what you're talking about. Yeah, okay. Um, then maybe I should try another tack. That'd be better. <clears throat> so, uh, before Jesus was in heaven, before he came to earth, where was he? I don't know, carry on. You don't know, okay. Do you realize that the Quran in um, uh, Surah 5, verse 33 says he returned to heaven? Okay. Did you realize that? Do you know what Muslims say when they die? Sorry. When somebody dies? Uh, no. From Allah we come and to Allah we return? Okay. So, so we have no issue with, with returning to God. Okay. So I don't see a point. How does right. this make Jesus God? Sorry. So but we all came from Allah. Were we conscious? Were we, the, were we the creator? Were we the creator? Two minutes left. <coughs> all right. So uh, if we all return to um, Allah, what were we before we became human beings? Spirit. Ah. So... We existed before we became human beings, as spirit. Possibly. Well, I don't see a point. So Why is Jesus... Possibly. Listen, listen, listen. Carlton, I don't know where you're going here. Is yeah. Jesus God oh. is the title. Okay. Uh. How is this proving Jesus is God? I don't get <clears> it. <throat> yes. If you ask the question... You've, you... you've gone from... Who else was in, God, in heaven? Elijah. Oh, um, mm, mm, oh okay. Um, he, he, he was uh, translated. What the hell? You're making up terms uh, okay. now. Okay, listen. And now... Yeah. I'm, I'm, now, I'm, that, I'm, now you're trying uh, to escape from yeah. it. Yeah. Asking me questions. <clears throat> Can you just respond to Sorry. the title of the talk? <laughs> Sorry, is it, is it my turn to ask questions? Yes. Well, like I said, you yes. wasted my time, but carry on. <clears throat> the point I'm trying to make is, before he became a human being, One minute left. he was in heaven. After he was uh, ascended, he was in heaven. You're saying that we all started um, with Allah and returned to Allah. Right. My question is, are we conscious uh, before we become human beings? Define conscious. Uh, aware, able to perceive, yes. able to understand. Yes. So before we became human beings, we were able to perceive yes. and understand. Does that not sound like, uh, what do the Indians call it again? No, I think there's a mistake there. Yeah. Thank uh, you uh, very much. Uh, well, well, At least one person's understanding yeah. it. So uh, that's called reincarnation. That we had consciousness before we became human beings and we go back to consciousness. I'm sorry, you are mistaken. And that's the difference with Jesus, you see, because he was conscious before he became a human being, conscious afterwards. So we are not How does like it make him. Jesus God? I don't get it. Yes, it, it makes him different to us. The point I'm trying to make is... Elijah is different to us. No, I'm sorry, Elijah isn't different to us. Did he die? Uh, no. He didn't die? Is no. he in heaven? Yes. Okay, are we going to die? All right, time. Mostly, yes. Time. Okay, we're going to get to the Q&A now. So, uh, is that alright if I keep this with me? So I apologise for speakers mode, uh, speakers corner. He's used to Hyde speaking Park speakers corner. <laughs> 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 right, I'll, I'll keep the timer, basically. So, um... Zach, Zach. Oh. Okay, okay, alright then. So, when the mic's given to you, then ask the question so it's uh, recorded clearly as well. Alright. Tell me when you're ready, and then. Um, Who wants to ask questions? Yeah, of course. Okay, um, I'll I'll just I'll just point I'll just point, I'll just exactly. point at. Exactly. You, you could appoint anybody. Uh, I'll point, but please keep the question brief and straight to the point, and um, mention who the question is is to uh, first, so, so we're prepared. Okay, first question goes to the brother there. Please state who is to. <laughs> and and please keep the questions under thirty seconds if you can. Jazakallah This is a question for Carlton. Um, when you're praying, who do you pray to? The Father. Jesus says, when you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven. No, but I mean, when you're praying, when, you go, when you're going to pray tonight, do you pray to Jesus or do you pray to God? I pray to the Father. I pray to God the Father. Is that it? Any response? Okay. Next question then, please, to the brother there. Uh, let the mic get to you. Um, okay, I'll, 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 I'll allow it on this occasion. Right. But please keep it brief then. 
So there are many Christians who do pray to Jesus, but they don't understand you, that they're supposed to pray to the Father. What do you go through? I can come and pray. Do you, do you go through the... Do yeah, you, go through the, you, know, you know what to do? What? Or do you pray directly oh, to the Creator? Oh. Give me easy one. Okay. Directly to the Creator. We say in Jesus' name, which means in His character, as He uh, taught us to pray. Does the prayer have to get carried? Brother, uh, Carlton. According to the Bible, the Holy Spirit does that yeah. for us. If you don't mind, and we'd like to keep it flowing, and afterwards uh, we'll have time to discuss, inshallah. And that, uh, what to do is ask the first question to one person. Yeah. Once they've done their rounds, then I'll allow you to do, ask a second question. Okay? No. So, All right, then. is that okay? Not really. Uh, well, what do you want to do? No, uh, All right, okay. Yeah. Ask a question, please. Uh, for Carlton, yeah? Can you define God, yeah? From the Bible, using the Bible <coughs> as evidence as well? Mm. Okay, so. Uh, it's got one more uh, I don't remember the text, but uh, here's what we believe God to be. God is eternal. He is all-powerful. Um, uh, all-powerful means he can create. Uh, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, and he's everywhere. Uh, we're from the Bible, my question is, we're from the Bible. <coughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm struggling. Okay. Uh, to, okay. to tell yeah. you. So I can't, I can't really accept that obviously because yeah. you don't have evidence. So, so, but, but, please but, no but, comment. But, yeah. but do you disagree that those are the attributes of God? Able to be everywhere, knows everything, and is eternal? No, uh, no he's not everywhere, no. Oh, God's not everywhere. No, no. Yeah, okay. Um, we'll, we'll, let, we'll let the Muslim speaker please. Okay, yeah. now my question. I, I can comment on that. Can you comment before you ask him yeah. his question? Okay. Yeah, um, I don't, like I said, you don't know where you get that information from, um, but. In Islam, obviously, we know exactly where we define God, and that's how we're so sure in what we believe. So, which, 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 which ayahs then? Carlton, so please. Um, it's the same sort of question, isn't it? Yeah. Which no, no, ayahs? Okay, 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 okay. One second, one second. I, I'm going to be a bit more firm now because it's getting all over the place. The person who asks the question, please don't give a comment afterwards. And no, the speaker no, just answers the question. Sorry, Chair, listen, I'm learning something here, right? Yeah. And so I think this little exchange is useful. Yeah. Um, so the only, only issue is it's going to become exchange every single okay. time. Then so let's just keep it flowing. Okay. So I, I, right, I'll okay. comment on it. Um, you ask where uh, in the Quran we have a beautiful surah, surah al ikhlas, uh, surah al -Ikhlas where it says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Qul wa Allahu Allahu Samad, Lam yalid wa Lam yulad wa Lam yikulu kufwan ahad, which means say He is Allah, the One, the Only. The self-sufficient master whom all creatures needs. He begets not, nor is he begotten, and there is nothing that be com com can be compared with him. That's what we believe. And that's why we're so sure in our understanding of what God is, whilst Christians are in such confusion because they don't know what God is. Sorry, that doesn't say that he is eternal. Uh, it simply says he's the only one of his kind. Okay, um, your next question okay, to... Next um, question, yeah, is to Hamza. Can you define God with evidences from the Quran? Yes. Yeah. And see, he just see, pre see previous answer. Yeah. Uh, that was done. So you you can comment now. Okay. Now you can comment. Right. So uh, from what I understood, you didn't define uh, someone who is eternal, someone who is uh, able to create. Uh, so omnipotent, omniscient. No, he said that he's the only one. There's, there's no one like him. That he's not begotten. Is is that the, the definition that I? He's the eternal. Allah is the eternal and there is nothing like to him, unto him. Says Allah, okay. one the only the eternal, the, the yeah. self-sufficient master whom all creatures need. He begets he not, nor is he begotten. And there is nothing that can be compared so with no him. Children, yeah. no so he has okay. no father. Sorry. Listen to the three things again. Omnipotent, that's all powerful. Right? Self-sufficient master whom all creatures need. Self-sufficient. Yeah. yeah. So that means that he's, he's independent. It, it, it isn't that he's all powerful. Name it something isn't. that's independent other um, than God. The sun. It's not independent. It's subject to the laws of nature. It's the laws of physics. Sorry. Um. Okay, it's, it's time on this question now. Okay, sorry about that. But, um, w you want to ask a question? Uh, uh, let, let the mic be. Oh. A few questions over here. Uh, we'll get to them next, inshallah. We'll just give a, a Christian an opportunity. Christian's lining me up. Yeah. Okay. You can ask your question now. Hold on. Hold on. Go for it. Sir. In your view, is God finite or infinite? In my view, mm. uh, infinite. Infinite. So there is no measure. You can't uh, measure it. Well, is okay. Your question is a little bit illogical because there's no such, in real terms, there's no such word as infinite. 
You can't count infinite. You can't measure infinite. So it doesn't really exist in the real world. It's only a concept. So, is it? So you use the word concept. So would you refer to God as you know, without a concept? Then or is there any you know, as I said, any boundaries? As to is that your whole question? Yeah. Okay, then um, time has started. Oh, you, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh okay. Okay, like I said about the infinite thing, it doesn't exist. So what, what are you saying is, does God have any boundaries? No. Is, is he have any limits? No. He does whatever befits his majesty. Yeah. Okay. In, immortal. Okay. Invisible. So, is he, is he, is he can you keep commenting? What, sorry? Yeah. Is he, is he immortal and invisible? Immortal? Yeah. I mean he cannot die? Yeah. Of course. Okay, so you asked your question, can my friend. Can I see him? No. Yeah. Alright, Carlton's turn now. <clears throat> Uh, he's he's I mean got infinite. Okay. Uh, um, Hams is right. Infinity is a concept. In that God cannot be bounded, um, then we finite humans cannot understand this unbounded or, another word, synonymous word is infinite God. So that's all Sam's asking. Okay. And uh, I think it's simple to say yes, I understand the concept. God cannot be bounded. Um, Quantify it. Yeah. Okay. He All right then. Okay. Well, he's immortal. Oh, he's immortal. Didn't die. Okay. 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 I'll get to you, inshallah. Well, we'll get one question from the back there. Then, um, right. We'll go to him, and then we'll go to you, inshallah. And then, yeah, I'll get to you, inshallah. It'll be like a, a circle, or right. Here. I think that's the right here. Yeah. Uh, just, oh, sorry. Uh, could I just say it's been a great uh, debate and uh, just a question to uh, Carlton. Uh, from the understanding I've had, from you saying that in the previous, in the Old Testament, Jesus uh, was, was God and in the New Testament, he was not God. You see, this is problematic for me because if you read verses like Malachi chapter 3, verse number 6, it says, I am the Lord, I do not change. Numbers chapter 23, verse number 19, I am God, not a man who has to lie or the son of man who has to repent. If you read Hosea chapter 11, verse number 9, I am God, not a man. So this is explicitly telling us that I am God and I do not change. Now, and then if you come into the New Testament, where you get verses like, I am a father of one, before Ab John chapter 8, verse 58, I am, you know, before Abraham was, I am. These are verses which Christians tell me that that's their proof of Jesus being God on earth. Now, either he, he cannot change his attributes or his essence, which, which, which clearly signifies uh, in, the, in the Old Testament. So how would you then say that, that he was God in the Old Testament and now he's not God? And he's God, and now he's not God? Superb question. Thank you. Superb question. So, um, whenever we want to understand anything in the Bible, we must get all the verses related, related to that topic together and then make a decision. So you're right, he doesn't change. Uh, at least he says doesn't change. But when you consider Revelation chapter 3 verse 5, Jesus Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That means the plan was already in place. So, because the plan's already in place, he's not going to change that plan. Nothing has uh, surprised them. There is no uh, change of, of idea. He was, the, the plan to uh, have Christ die was set at the foundation of the world. And therefore, now that we understand it, we see, oh, he hasn't changed. The plan was set right at the beginning. If our uh, foreparents, Adam and Eve, sinned, then the plan to redeem them rather than just destroy the planet and then move on to the next one was that Christ would become a human being, would die the death that they deserved so that he could give them the life, the eternal life that God wanted for everyone. You done? Uh, your turn, if you want to comment. Okay, what Carlton now is quoted now seems to show God to be unjust and with no mercy. Uh, because first thing he's saying now is that because Adam sinned, that we all now inherit this sin because of Adam's sin. Not because of anything we've done, just because our ancestor Adam sinned. Now the problem he's got here is Ezekiel refutes that. Ezekiel says clearly, if anyone is a wicked man and turns, sins, he shall die. Anyone turns away from his wickedness, and, come to, and becomes righteous and keeps the statutes of the Lord, then those wickedness will not be reminded of him. So we, cl we clearly see repentance here. Now, this idea of no mercy, because according to what Carlton's saying now, God requires payment for your sin. You know, he can't just forgive your sin, he requires payment. Now, you can't say, um, well, I can't give you the money, but he's going to give you the money. 
I still got paid. Yeah, there, there's no mercy here. According to his paradigm, there's no mercy, nor is there any forgiveness, and nor is no justice. You done? Yeah. Okay, then uh, next question to the brother there. Just uh, wait for the... My question is to Carlton, if somebody were to have a vision about God today, would you accept it? Um, we are to listen to all visions uh, and all people who say they have visions. Um, the Bible test of visions are, um, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 21 and 22, if a prophet uh, speaks in the name of the Lord and the thing uh, happens that they say is going to happen, then uh, you can... Uh, accept them. Jeremiah 28 10 says the same thing. If they say something's going to happen and it doesn't happen, God has not told them anything. So because God is real and because he says he speaks in dreams and visions, it's possible that any one of us in here could have that vision. It is my responsibility to listen to it uh, and to check that it's in harmony with the scripture and to also check that the prophecies they say come true. So those are really important. Must be in harmony with scripture, must come true. Otherwise, um, you know that it's error. You done? Okay. You want to comment? Well, again, now, now is um, Carlton seems to indict Jesus in this now because according to the New Testament, Jesus prophesied that the end of days was coming in his disciples' uh, generation. He was telling them what they will see. He was telling them to prepare for it. Um, he, he was saying they will be on the 12th council judging it. Um, Paul carries on with this. He Paul says that um, if you're a slave, don't worry about being a slave, and if you're not married, don't worry about getting married, and if don't worry about starting business because the end is coming. So we know if you read the, the New Testament with honest eyes, it's a doomsday book. Everyone's waiting for the end to come. They were expecting it to come in their time. This prophecy has not been fulfilled because the disciples are long dead, and we're still it, and the, the stars haven't fallen, and all of these things. Will it be fulfilled? It hasn't been. That's not my question. You're very good at not answering questions. Oh, sorry, forgive me. The disciples are dead. He said in this generation, he pointed to them and said, what, you'll what, be judging. What was my question? Um, will it happen? Thank you. Okay, no, because mm. the disciples are dead. Okay. It's supposed to happen in their generation. So Christ like, ah, will not it. come. No. I'm sure your Quran says he will come. It was supposed to come in their generation. Sorry. Okay, uh, next question um, to the Fat Foundation. Uh, okay, let the mic get to him. Ooh. Um, thanks, Carlton. Again, very interesting discussion. Um, I have to be—I have to say that I've been left a little bit confused by your position, and I think it's probably because it's unorthodox. And the confusion is—is is that, from what I understand, speaking to norm normative Christians or normative Christians, is that they believe that the reason for God to come to Earth to die as a man is because a divine sacrifice was required to pay for sin. <laughs> The problem that I'm left with, actually, is your understanding of how a non-divine sacrifice is sufficient to pay for infinite sin. Because you say initially there was a trinity, in, or, or there was a, tro a Godhead. Godhead in heaven, uh, which seems to consist of three beings independent of each other, actually, and not, a, a not, a, well, not one being with three personalities. And then you say one of those beings manifests on earth, divulging himself of all divinity completely and being only human being. Um, but that somehow was sufficient then a human sacrifice to pay for infinite sin that may have been in the past and in the future. Um, I don't know how you reconcile that because it, the idea was of having a perfect divine sacrifice is what the normative understanding is. I was wondering what, how you would go about <coughs> explaining that. Again, thank you for a superb question. Um, <clears throat> the sin, or sin only exists on this planet. It exists because Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate the fruit. So, who did the first sin? Adam and Eve, human beings. Christ came to earth for two reasons. One was to show us how God wants us to live. And so, in John 17, he says, I finished the work you gave me to do. That's the uh, example of how to live. He also came to die. And so on the cross, he said, it's finished. And so the salvation aspects of his ministry was finished. So because Adam was human, God becoming man shows that tremendous mercy and love that he's prepared to give up the ability to be uh, omnipresent to save this planet of people that don't care about him. Now, until we are parents, a father, we don't understand that. But when our children are, are bad, the reason why we 
do our best to help them to get back uh, on the right way is because of that love that God has shown and has put within everyone's heart. So Christ was simply demonstrating that uh, when he came, he lived and died because he knew uh, he would be resurrected if he was faithful, as all of us who trust in him will be resurrected and be able to live eternally. So the sacrifice was worth it because those who love him will live for him for eternity. Okay, you want to uh, remark? <sighs> yes. <laughs> Um, Carlton paints this picture that um, Jesus um, is the sacrifice to atone for the original sin. Now, basically, according to the Orthodox Christianity, I'm not sure whether Carlton believes this, but according to Orthodox Christianity, um, they used to sacrifice animals as a blood sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. Now, the problem you have here is that that forgiveness of sin was only for unintentional sin. It wasn't for all sins. So if the sacrifice of animals was for unintentional sin and Jesus is supposed to replace those animals, then Jesus is only dying for unintentional sins and you still have the problem of intentional sins, i.e. you need something extra, which is obviously repentance. Now the problem you've also got with this forgiveness and this justice is that what about the Eskimos? Yeah, because there's conditions on this salvation. You have to believe Jesus died for you. The Eskimos in the time of Jesus wouldn't have known that, um, or whoever, whichever generation or whichever community lived that never heard of Jesus. Where is their salvation? It doesn't make sense. In Islam, it's very, very simple. Allah says, turn to me back, turn back to me and I'll forgive you. Time. Alhamdulillah. Okay, um, question. I, sorry. Okay, I'll let you comment. Uh, yeah, because he keeps on saying, he, he understands what I'm saying, but he's not understanding what I'm saying. This is what uh, the Bible says. Um, it says, Romans chapter 2, 13 to 16. Not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are law unto themselves, and they show the work of the Holy Spirit working in their hearts. In other words, there are people, hundreds and thousands of people, who don't know Jesus Christ, but their nature is just like that of Him. And they don't believe Jesus died for that's exactly what I'm saying. So belief in Jesus dying for you is not necessary for salvation. That's uh, what you're saying. Yes. Okay. However, okay. yes, I know you don't want to hear any more. No, 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 no. The Christians don't want to hear any more. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really struggling to stay respectful to you. Um, this is a discussion, a debate. You can be confident with what you already know. Or you might listen and learn something new. You've just learned that you don't need to believe in Jesus Christ. I would like to explain why that is from the Bible. Okay. I didn't say you have to believe in Jesus Christ. Listen to the words. I said, I said believe don't have to. Jesus died for your sins. Or, Conditional. Yes, correct. I said you don't have to you believe Jesus. You don't need Jesus to believe Jesus died for you. Correct. That was exactly oh. the same answer oh. I gave you a few moments okay. ago. Uh, I'll give you 30 seconds more to answer, yeah. Carlton, and then we'll move on to the so, next one. What God wants from all of us is to have a nature like his, that loving nature. There are many people who have that nature and uh, they will be saved. However, if you hear about Jesus and what he has done and you decide, I do not want to um, accept his teachings and his way, then when he comes again, the responsibility is yours. But he'll kill everyone then. Okay. No, because not everyone is going to say, I'm not interested. I'll put time on this question now. The next question is in that direction for the brother. Thank you very much, brother. Uh, my question is about John 17, 3, which uh, justifies the belief of Christian Ebionites and Christian Quaker, besides the Muslim belief also, and the first Jews believed in Jesus, which gave through the very easy linguistic grammar, God and the messenger, very fair, transparent, and simple belief. And addition to he is the messenger being, is not God. In very first of Genesis, the head of the Christian theology and philosophy of the whole Protestant church addressing 20 Christian ministers and the priests will attend, I was among them also, he revealed the Hebrew dictionary related to let us kill, uh, create man into our image. He said, no, the original Hebrew verse say into our shadow, which can be identified with the Muslim verse of the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, Surah 2, verse 30. Uh, remember when God said to the angels, I'm going to create to this planet Earth via gerund. 
which is like to representative. Mm. So bringing the Aramaic Bible, which may be, will be compatible or identical with the Quran. Jesus, uh, Adam and Eve uh, were vicegerent, representative of God, not like God, because verse number and Jeremiah say no one like God. Okay, thank you very much. Thank what you very much. Say about that? Okay. Um, your question, undermining your question, the oneness of God, okay, which brother. destroys the salvation. Yes. Okay, yeah. I'll uh, let him answer that. Uh, it's a good question, but it reveals that you came late, because we looked at um, John seventeen verse three. So Damn. let me read John, John seventeen verse three, uh, and I'll bring out the point I brought out earlier. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, referring to the Father, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So eternal life <coughs> requires a knowledge of the Father and Jesus Christ. Speak about the name of the pastor. Oh, yeah. Okay, brother, he's going to... Uh, you done? Yeah. Hamza, you want to comment? <coughs> I mean the grammar. John 17, 3. Grammar of sender, yeah, John, sender, yeah. No, no, John 17, sender. 3 is very, very... Mm. Look, mm. Carlton's ignored mm. beta mm. verses in the Old Testament where God says he's the only one, there's nothing like him, nothing before him, nothing after him. He's completely ignored that. Yeah. Um, and now he's ignoring John 17, 3 where it's clear there's only one God, yeah? Jesus prayed to that God. Jesus begged that God for mercy, yeah? Jesus took his power from that God, took permission from that God. It's clear who is the God and who is the servant. Even in the New King James Bible, Jesus is referred to as the servant of God. Now he's got his own servant, of course he isn't. Okay, then um, next question for the brother there, and then we'll go to the uh, to the brothers here. Brother. Yeah, well. Okay. Carlson, this question's for yourself. Um, today, when you made your presentation, you made it very clear that you believe in the King James Version of the Bible. When Hamza was pointing the question to you about the, um, the prophecy um, with the stars falling and, and the day of judgment or the, the end of the earth coming in the time of the, um, the generation of Jesus, right? you seem to be disputing about the wording of the verse. Um, Hamza was making out that it's supposed to happen within their time and you was holding on to another point about Jesus. I think you missed the point. I'd like to see that point be concluded by you finding that verse and read it out so we know what is the actual word in that verse and let us know whether we actually believe in that verse and has it happened? Uh, again, a superb question. Um, the It's Matthew chapter 24. This generation shall not pass. Until... So when it refers to all the different signs, uh, this generation... Uh, it finishes by saying, this generation shall not pass until all be fulfilled. So let me cheat and use the search. I think it's Mark so, 13, 32 as well. That has it. Okay, so um, <coughs> as I search for it, what it's referring to, all these signs you will see. I would like to find it because yeah, I, yeah, I okay. want to see who was correct about the word you see. Okay. Verse 34, so it gives you um, tribulation after those days, the sun shall not be darkened, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Uh, he Brothers, can you stop talking please and listen to the speaker? He will send his area. angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. Um, likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verse 34, verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So you can either consider that this generation is the audience he's speaking to or the audience that see all these things happening. Okay, time. Isn't that still the same generation? No, uh, no, no it, right. If these things are happening in our time and Christ comes in our time. Their time. Yes. There are two views. Their time is the audience, the disciples at the time. 
this generation shall not pass. That is one view. The other view, which you may not believe, is when all these things happen, that generation shall not pass. So you can expect that in the space of 40 or 50 years, when all these things are happening, that generation shall not pass until uh, you see the Son of Man, um, all these things be fulfilled. You want to comment? Okay, so the debate now is whether this is referred to this generation now or this generation whenever these things are happening. So how do we determine which one it is? Well, we look at the promises made to the disciples. They were told they would be seated on, sit on the 12 councils, yeah? We know Paul, who apparently was uh, hearing Revelation. Um, he, he was telling people, if you're a slave, don't worry about it. If, if you've not got a business, don't worry about starting a business. If you're not married, don't worry about getting a wife because the end is coming. So if you want to look for reasons what this generation means, it's, it's pretty obvious. And also, Jesus said, uh, the temple will be destroyed, not a stone will stand and such, at the same time as well. Okay, um, the question at the back now, please. Uh, there's a brother there, um, the brother there with a white hat. My question's for Carlton. Um, basically, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned about prophecies in the Bible. And so my question is that, um, why do you reject the prophet Muhammad? Wasallam, who was prophesied in the Bible when today even we still have verses in the Bible where Jesus mentions about somebody to come after him and the Prophet Muhammad clearly fulfilling those prophecies so why do you not accept the Prophet Muhammad as a messenger of God? Uh, I don't see how he fulfilled the prophecy uh, that Jesus made in um, John 14, 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So um, it, it explains that it's the Holy Ghost. But you, um, just, just as a comment, um, the Holy Ghost was, was present in the lifetime of Jesus, though. So how can it be that Jesus says he has to go for the Holy Ghost to then come? Right. Uh, there is no doubt that the Holy Spirit was present while Christ was on earth. Um, what Christ is saying is, when I go back, that Holy Spirit isn't just going to be with me um, in Jerusalem and Israel, but it's going to be universal. So the Holy Spirit is, um, on the day of Pentecost, it was the Holy Spirit that, um, on uh, there were 15 different languages being spoken, they all heard in their own language. The Holy Spirit was... Um, an integral part of that gospel going throughout Asia and spreading uh, throughout the world. So, yes, the Holy Spirit was present while Christ was here, but um, it's only the Holy Spirit after Christ has gone to heaven. Would you like to comment? Okay, uh, it's quoted from John again. Uh, in my opening statement, I spoke about the Gospel of John and how it's completely out of sync with everything else it says. Uh, now, me personally, I take a, a bit of a strange stance on this particular one because I don't go along with the paraclete uh, prophecy. Forgive me, brother. Um, when I read John 14 and then I read 15, 16 and 17, they make no sense at all. John 14 speaks about someone to come after him, the prince of this world and such. I have no issue with that. 15, 16 and 17, to be honest with you, I believe are out of place. Why is this? Well, if you read John 14, Jesus says to his disciples, now this is the time before he's going to be arrested, before the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah? And Jesus says to the disciples, I will not speak much more to you now. Okay. Now, in some Bibles, the word much is not there. So it's, I will not speak more to you now. Come on, let us leave this place. And then in 15, 16, 17, we have Jesus in this elaborate speech. Give it, the longest speech he ever makes is in this particular place. Now, how does that make any sense? He says, come on, let us leave. I'm not going to speak more to you now. And then he's going to do this massive speech. It makes no sense. When you read John 18, it says, and after Jesus said these words, he prayed and left. You put it together, um, I'll say not much, much more to you now, come on, let us leave this place. And after he said these words, he prayed and left. This means that these three verses are not, it shouldn't even be there, right, personally. Okay. So which three verses? 15, 16 and 17. Oh, chapters. Okay. Right. The next question is... Um, um, Can you say something to that at all? Uh, okay. So please. Okay. <laughs> He's 100% correct because those qualities, yeah, which qualities? the messenger... What he, what he was talking about with regards to the verses in relation to what the, bro the brother was saying about the messenger Muhammad's uh, coming and things like that, saying that it's mentioning, he's actually correct because what it is, his qualities, the description fits the messenger's qualities, but you can't say conclusively that it's speaking about the messenger Muhammad. 
And a lot of Muslims use this as a proof to say that, look, the messenger is mentioned in the Bible, but we can't conclusively say that. All we can say is that those descriptions, the description, he does fit that, and we believe that, but we can't say it's 100% correct. Okay. I like that because um, I, I said right at the outset, the Quran establishes the Bible. A lot of You're incorrect there. You're incorrect there because the Quran doesn't mention the Bible. The, yeah, mention, the, talks about the Bible the talks words. about the people of the book. The, and the people book. of the book yes. testified and believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. So the, the people now are not the people of the book. You're not a person of the book Sorry. because you believe in the Trinity. And the message was Ashadu la ilaha illallah. Every okay. messenger, okay. what was revealed to Isa was Ashadu la ilaha illallah. Right. That's the book. Okay. In effect, because it wasn't an actual book, he wasn't turn? given a book, he was given a message. Okay, brother, can we let Carlton um, answer and then we'll okay. get next so, person, please? As I said, the Quran, and thank you for the correction, talks about the book and the people of the book. Verse 26 The Comforter, let's not say who it says here, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. And bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Right? Now, there isn't much in the Quran of what Isa has said unto his disciples. Isn't much. You want to find out what he said? Uh, although you say there are discrepancies, it's here. It's not in the Quran. Uh, neither is it in uh, great detail in the Hadiths. So he doesn't fulfill that because he doesn't bring. Yeah, but what we've gone past that now. We've retracted. We've retra okay, we brother. Said that there's certain. Yeah, we'd like to keep it flowing, please. Jazakallah here. Eh? Would you like to give a comment before Can next? I just say if, if those verses are not pointing specifically to the Prophet Muhammad, so why do you nevertheless reject the Prophet Muhammad That's as a messenger question. of God? Um. So I I I I mentioned earlier. How can we know God's writings? So, this is the Bible test of a prophet. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, verse 22. Well, 21 and 22. If you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet <coughs> speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid or respect him. So, the key thing about the word of the Lord is prophecy. When someone speaks on behalf of the Lord, they will say what's going to happen. The test is, did it happen? And that is why I don't accept it. Because there are over 2,000 prophecies in the Bible, which science has not yet disproved a single one, uh, I have confidence in this. I have not found anything else like it. Okay, would you, you like... Uh, brother, uh, brother, we, we can't keep this going on, please, brother. But did you brother. There, there was brother, brother, respect, brother, respect, respect the format. Brother, please uh, respect the format. Please, okay. brothers, and uh, nobody else keep jumping in because it's not flowing then. It's going, this is going to go on YouTube and we're not going to look organized at all. So could, could you give a comment, please? <laughs> yeah, I was going to comment. Let me comment. Yeah, he's just going to comment. Then we'll get to the It's only a very short comment of what huh? he just said. So basically, he was asked why you don't accept Muhammad as, as a prophet of God. And he then said, oh, a prophet should speak and whatever he says should come to pass. And everything in the Bible that is spoken about comes to pass. Okay, we didn't ask that question. The question was asked, why not Muhammad Sallallahu So my challenge to you, Carlton, maybe not now, and for all you Christians watching, name one thing Muhammad Sallallahu said that didn't come to pass. Because you're rejecting him on this authority. So that means you know something he said didn't happen. So I challenge you, bring it. Okay, then uh, next question to uh, uh, Brother Faisal there. Then we'll get to Ayah uh, straight after them, inshallah. Um, again, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, in the New I'll Testament, you, you believe that Jesus was a man. Yes. Okay, not God. Yes. Okay. Now, the reason why, again, I find it very problematic is purely, purely because of the fact that when Jesus he had 12 disciples, we know Judas when he, when he died. We don't know whether he was hungry or whether he, we don't know that, okay? Then he had 11 disciples. But if you read Luke chapter 24, verse number 33, when Jesus came back to his disciples, he met the 11. In, uh, in, in, in Mark chapter 16, verse number 14, he appeared to the 11. Now, for the 11 to be there, you would have expected Thomas to be there. Because otherwise it would have been 10. Now the question is, is when you look, when you read John chapter 20 verse number 24 onwards, 
It says Thomas, who was called Didymus, was not there when Jesus appeared to him. He appeared 11, uh, eight days later. And when he appeared to him, he said, unless I don't touch him with my finger or the holes that, that has been made, I will not believe him. So when he sees him, which is, it says, my Lord, my God. <coughs> so the question is, in your eyes, from, if you're saying he's not God, I personally believe that verse is spurious because as I say, it doesn't add up. But it's because it's in the King James, you either have 11 disciples who were present or you have 10, because Thomas wasn't there. But in hindsight, if he wasn't there, but he's calling Jesus, my Lord, my God. So could you please comment on that? Okay, please? again, um, really good questions. So firstly, uh, I'm looking at Mark 16, verse 14. Yes. Um, but before I do that, I have to go um, to, uh, let's start with 10. So it's talking about Mary Magdalene went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. 11. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had, seen, had been seen of her, believed not. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. That's Luke 24. Um, and that's Sunday evening. And they went and told it unto the residue. Uh, so they came straight back. Neither believed they them. 14. Afterwards doesn't say whether it's the next day or the next few minutes. Afterwards, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not on them which had seen him after he was risen. This isn't saying that um, this is the, the first time where there was ten of them or the second time when Thomas was present. It's simply saying he appeared unto the eleven. So if it's the eleven when Thomas is there and Thomas doesn't believe, why is that a problem? I'll tell you why it's a problem because if it says he came and saw him, he was not there present and he said... And if you read John chapter 20, verse number 24, he appeared eight days later. Yes. So, so he appeared eight days later, whether it was the first uh, instant or whether it was the second day instant, if, the, if he saw the 11, Thomas should have been there. Right. Mark 16, 14 yes. begins with afterward. 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 After the two of them were on their way, way to Emmaus. Yes. And, they uh, so, and, and, and they went back and told the rest. Yes. Afterward. Afterward, it can be one day, it can be eight days. Okay, so when, no, no, no. Could it could it be one day? But when, but when if you could read, afterward be one day? I, I totally agree. But if you read John chapter twenty verse number twenty four, your answer will be you, the question will be answered because he said he was not present when Jesus appeared to them. Because they're talking about two different things. Mark is talking about afterwards. John talks about the first time, one day after, and 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 Luke is mentioned in verse thirteen at twelve and thirteen. He appeared to two as they walked into another country. So when, so when they appeared to him, when Jesus appeared to them, yeah. was, Mark, was Thomas there? When he appeared to the two, no. No, no, when he appeared to the eleven. Um, <coughs> verse 14 says, afterwards. Okay, Which, are you talking to me about John here? Oh, sorry, you're, 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 I'm you're talking about see? Mark. Yeah. Mark so says afterwards. So sorry, sorry. Exactly. We're not going to turn fro. Listen sure. carefully. But the afterwards now, can be oh. one day yes. or it can be eight days. You believe it's oh. one day. Yes. Oh. I believe it's eight days. So okay, brother. Call? Brother, that's is it, that's it, that's it. brother, please. Can you just explain to me? No, brother, it's Hamza's turn to speak now, brother. Okay. No, no, he's right. He's right. Yeah, because you started by saying, uh, the New Testament. I didn't argue with it because I don't like to be too um, argumentative. However, I, I, what I says was he became a human being. When he died and was resurrected, he's God again. So when Thomas says after his resurrection, he's God. But he died as a man. Okay, Carlton, this hands his uh, turn now. <sighs> All right. So I think I can end this kind of to and fro of this verse 14 later. Was it? Okay. According to the oldest reliable manuscripts, there is no verse after 1610. According to the most reliable manuscripts of Mark, and the older you are to the autograph, the more accurate you are, it ends with the women fleeing and speaking to nobody. Now here's a question. If the women flee and spoke to nobody, how does anybody know what happened there? It doesn't make logical sense. The women were afraid, they spoke to nobody, then all of a sudden everybody knows what happened at the tomb. It, make, it makes no sense whatsoever. <coughs> And, this, and these verses that are added later are found only in the 6th century manuscripts. They're not found in the 4th century manuscripts. They're a later edition. And because uh, Carlton subscribes to the King James Version of the Bible, he retains them. But again, the question I asked earlier, why? Why are you using later manuscripts over all the more reliable manuscripts? You okay, um, Brother Ayers, this question now. We have to have a dialogue on um, Bible manuscripts. Well, we'll arrange it. Uh, if, we, if, we su if we survive this one. <laughs> uh, your question. I can't tell you. Okay. Um, 
My question is very simple. I remember previously you had a debate with Sadat Anwar quite a while ago, and um, you used that Jesus was worshipped as a proof text to prove that he was God. And I remember I bought the verse about Daniel, but I'm a bit confused because you use that as a proof text, but according to you, Jesus is just a man on earth, and we know that you should never worship a man, correct? Correct. So when the disciples worshipped Jesus, did they commit blasphemy? Uh, no, they didn't. <clears throat> and again, a superb question. I'm glad you've asked it. Because um, God is everywhere. He knows everything. Um, and he's eternal. Jesus as a man clearly wasn't. However, if you think of a, a, a caterpillar that changed into a butterfly. Uh, the caterpillar can't fly, but the butterfly can. Now, although they are very different in terms of their characteristics, the identity is the same. So, the creature that started as caterpillar is the same creature that is now butterfly. Why do they worship Jesus? Not because of his attributes, but because of his identity. Because he existed before he was a man, uh, and is the same person who created everything, even though now as a man, he's a man, they recognize that he existed before, Messiah, uh, Almighty God, um, and that's why they are saying it. He never says it himself, but that's why they say it, because of his identity. The fact that he existed before, became a man, uh, and they recognize that. The devils, um, people who weren't even Christians, the disciples. Would you like to comment? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. The, the, the whole topic was, is Jesus God? And you, you yourself admitted that Jesus is not God, he's a man walking the earth. So what gave these disciples, whoever thought he was God, the idea he was God? Because you said he was a man, he behaved like a man, he, he, he was hungry, he thirsted and such. Yeah. So what, the, the, the disciples didn't read Revelations. They didn't know about dragons and six heads and all this business. They're just walking with Jesus. So in answer to the brother's question, I mean, what you've just said there makes no sense whatsoever, unless... The worship we're referring to here is not worship as in you worship God. It's just, um, it's like a reverence, adoration uh, that you would give to a king or somebody that you realize is some of some importance. Yeah, that's the only way you can reconcile this. You can't say that they knew he was pre-existing because they didn't know he's pre-existing because there was no concept of a Messiah being pre-existing. So I don't know why you brought that up as some kind of defense, but it makes no sense whatsoever. Before Abraham was, I am. What does that mean? Uh, they understood it. That's why they wanted to kill him. Okay. Well, you, didn't understand, you don't understand it. Okay, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you how I understand it in a logical sense. You're saying Jesus was asked, how do you know these things? Because these things, you know, you weren't around at that time. What did he say? <laughs> Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. What's he saying? Now, Christians interpret this. Now, this is for you mainstream Christians here. Um, you, you Christians interpret this to mean that Jesus is declaring he is God. How does that make any sense? All he's saying is, if I am means God... He's basically saying before Abraham was God, and obviously he's a messenger of God, so he would know because God would tell him because he's his messenger. Now, if you're trying to make the claim that he is claiming to be I am, it would be before Abraham, I am, I am. That would make sense. But the way you're trying to interpret it, it makes no sense whatsoever. Okay, um, the next question is for the... Okay, then. Get to you next. So the Christian belief rests upon the Bible. My question is about the New Testament. How do you really know what's in there can be attributed to Jesus? So like who was Matthew, Mark, Luke and John? How can you really believe their word for it, what they reported? Again, another superb question. Uh, I haven't met these guys. Uh, all I know is what people say. Um, they are who they are, what they've done. What I can do though is what I read in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 21-22. There are many prophecies that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Paul, and James, and Peter um, describe in the Bible. Science has yet to show that any of those prophecies have failed. I, uh, in looking at the Bible, looked at the prophecies, and I too have not found one that has failed yet. So although I don't know who they are, all I know is the name that's associated with their book, but I can read what they say and I can see that their prophecies uh, are consistent. I can see that the history, there is uh, evidence that there was a Jesus Christ, 
uh, you say he was a prophet. Um, the Quran says that those who follow the word, even though uh, you say we don't have the word anymore, um, are uh, to or used to be respected. So if the Quran's endorsing the Bible um, and th what they say is true and prophecies uh, come true, then, you know, that's a good basis to, to believe it. Would you like to comment? Yes. Okay. Um, no in England, we have a beautiful saying, the devil is in the detail. Yeah. So if you're in a court of law and you have two witnesses to an event and they contradict one another, this is thrown out as evidence because it's a contradiction. Who, who, who is telling the truth here? If we look at the Gospels, there's clear differences in all of them with the details, whether it be the last words of Jesus, whether it be what happened to Jesus after he was born, whether it be what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. There's so many differences. Like I said to you with the fig tree, Matthew is saying that the, um, after he abused the people in the temple, then he cursed the tree. Mark is saying the tree was cursed and then he abused the people in the temple. There's, there's, there's a problem with the chrono chronology here. So when you look what people are saying things and it doesn't quite add up, we've got a problem here. So then we have to question, do you really know? Which is what my brother is saying here. You don't know who's saying this. You don't know what they're saying. Is it true? And we know, for example, the beautiful story in the Gospel of John of the adulterous woman when he, she brought in adultery and said, he without sin cast a first stone. And this shows everyone's a sinner. Beautiful story. Fantastic. Problem is, it's not in the oldest reliable manuscript of John. So now we have a story found in later manuscripts, again, not found in the original. What's going on here? Later manuscripts should be copies of earlier manuscripts. Now, scribes can make mistakes and copy something twice or forget to write something, but they're adding whole stories here. They're putting words into the mouth of Jesus he never said. And there's many verses that this has happened to. Acts 8, 37 is another one. I, and even Carlton in his last debate was said that. He quoted verses like this. So we've got a problem. How do you know Jesus said these words? Because one Bible saying he said them, another Bible saying he didn't say them. This is the issue we have, and all of your belief that Jesus died for your sins and all of this business is based on this book. And that is why I stripped it down in my opening statement and you completely and utterly ignored what you should have been going for. Okay, yeah, I'm your Sorry, turn that was now. A bit of a conclusion, forgive me. <coughs> Carlton, um, you know, with the, you know the, last, the last question I asked was, can you define God with evidence? He said no, but it's, it's through guesswork basically that you said is omnipotent, <coughs> omnipresent. Because obviously without, without any evidence, it's, it's, it's just guesswork, isn't it? It's not a fact. Yes, yeah, so, because, so I, because I can't find the verses, does that mean it doesn't exist? You said you don't have one? No, I says I can't um, you you remember them. I, I, yeah, you said you yeah. couldn't get one. Yeah. Got evidence. Can't you Google you them? Uh, yes, yeah, I, 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 Google I can. Them. You want me to find them now? Yeah, please, please. Yeah, yeah. No, please no problem. Do. Because I thought that, I thought the last time I asked you said you never had one. Yes, so I haven't got one in my head right now. Um, I can't remember everything. I actually the, quoted it twice in Isaiah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's just one of. Well, um, you only asked for one. Sorry. Um, so Deuteronomy 33, 27, the eternal God is thy refuge. Isaiah 60, 15, I make thee an ex eternal excellency. Um, and there are lots of others on, on eternal. Um, no, but you said you said he was omnipresent, omniscient. Yeah, knows everything. Uh, yeah. So omniscient means he's able to he's, do everything, the creator. Yeah. So uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, you know, clearly God is the creator. That's, so, the, that's the all power. evidence from the Bible for that? Uh, Genesis chapter 1, um, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. So only God can create. Yeah. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 1. Um, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, without Him was not, nothing made that was made. Um, uh, and omniscient. So the reason why we say that Christ isn't God is because uh, He says, no one knows the day or the hour of His return except the Father. So the Father knows everything. Yeah. Okay. And omnipresent, you said? Um, can we make the, the last one? Yeah, no, no, I've got one more. Just one bit okay. after this, because oh. I um, know he's going to say this. Very good. If I... Uh, Psalms 138. Where can I go from my spirit? If you don't know, don't worry. You say don't know. It's, it's in... I said don't know earlier. He wants you want me to find them. And because I can't find them, he doesn't believe it. Uh, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I hide from your eyes? Um, could, could you ask the next okay, one then, instead? Okay, then? just to make it quick, because obviously, if, it's, if you know, God's like, a, God's like a, you know, he's the main thing in your religion, so you should yeah. know it at the back of your hand. So now my next part, the, my question originally was basically, how, if, you can, if you can just about define God and with evidence, how can you say that Jesus is God? If you don't know what God is, then how do you know who he is? So how do you know Jesus is God? From what you're telling me, that he knows all. 
Jesus didn't know. Okay. You want to answer um, that? Well, so those three things, um, I didn't hear uh, Humza give me all th a, a verse for all three of those things. Oh, wait, it's coming. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't do the Quran justice earlier. No, I will do it justice. Would you like me to go while you're looking? Um, now let God. Yeah, if you, if you found it, then you go. Oh, yeah, I've been waiting for the past half an hour for that to come yeah. up again. Go on then. Okay. Allah, oh, Bismillah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah, there is no deity except Him, the ever-living, the sustainer of all existence. Neither drowsiness overtakes Him nor sleep. To Him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. Who is it that can intercede with Him except by His permission? He knows what is presently before them and what will be after them. And they encompass not a thing of His knowledge except for what He wills. His cursey, His throne, extends over the heavens and the earth, and their preservation ties Him not. And he is the most high, the most great. So now I covered everything, yeah? Yep. So Carlton, um, do you want to... Can we demolish 1-1 one, one while you're doing that as well? Uh, if you like. Okay, John 1-1. One, one. So we're waiting for this to come out. been a while. Um, I thought it would have come out earlier, basically, where it says in the beginning was a word, a word with God, a word was God, and the word became flesh. Okay. Problem is this. They try to claim that Jesus is the word, and he's with God. Now, the problem you've got here is God is comprised of... Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, according to the Trinity, and according to him, the Godhead consists of these three things. So how can the Word be separate from God if the Word is part of God? It makes no sense whatsoever. You say it makes no sense, an awful lot. Um, well, okay. uh, listen, uh, if you're going to take someone's argument down, at least understand why they believe it. To not understand why they believe it, you can't dismantle it. To say it makes no sense uh, isn't helping your case at all. Uh, now, I may understand your position, but disagree with it. But at least I understand it. Fair enough. Forgive me. Okay. So, how can God, comprising of a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Trinity, according to Orthodox Christianity, not your heretical understanding, um, but according to your heretical understanding, there's still one Godhead. So, how can the Word be separate from God, <coughs> if they're one God? God is comprised of these three things. Uh, can you answer uh, that? Yeah, well, uh, I've distracted him from what he was doing. Yeah, okay. No, 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 no don't, don't worry. Answer, yeah. Okay, question, I've answered it before, I'll answer it again. For this course shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Now, that one flesh is the, the perfect marriage. We don't really have them here on earth. But father and son, uh, God and the word perfectly united. Yeah, but... But God, God is part, the word is part of God. Okay, uh, what I'm going to do is just ask you one more time, and no matter how Carlton asks you, we're going to move on, okay? Yeah. With. Yeah, but he was no, no, no. The word, yeah. the word was with. Okay. With God. Okay. And God. Well, you believe God is comprised okay. of three. Uh, one Sorry. second. You said the word is Jesus, yes? Yeah. Correct. And Jesus is part of God, yes? Right, excuse me. A uh, husband and wife no, make no, no, let's, one... No, no, let's do John 1. -1. Sorry, I'm dealing with John 1. Okay. I'm dealing with John 1. One. Okay. Oh. If a husband and wife are one flesh, yeah. yet two individuals... I haven't mentioned one. Okay. Sorry. Did you manage to find a verse called... The husband... Um, <laughs> well, he, as he says, okay. the husband is with the wife. The word was with God. Yeah, so who is God? What is comprised of God? Give in this? other people a chance. Okay, uh, let's, let's move on from here, please. Okay, um... Come on. Just uh, one uh, one question before I, I move to you, and we've only got five minutes left, isn't it? So one, uh, uh, if we get time, uh, it's a question that uh, a brother wanted to ask, but he never had. Uh, he, he just doesn't want to ask it himself, Carlton. You know, you mentioned that um, science hasn't disproved um, anything in the Bible yet. The prophecies. Okay. Uh, okay. Prophecies um, or whatever. Um, no, not or, or okay. whatever. Okay. But any, anyway, how do you reconcile with it? And I'm not saying whether the scientists are right or the Bible is right. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, the question is, the scientists believe that the universe is like millions and millions of years old. But does the Bible teach that or does the Bible teach that the, um, the earth is less than 6,000 years old? It teaches the world is less than 6,000 years old. The Bible teaches that? Yes. So the scientists... Uh, it, it, it doesn't teach it actually. I okay. spent two years going through all the genealogies of the Bible okay. and there is no doubt whatsoever that the world is less than 6,000 years old if the Bible account of um, creation is true and when um, yeah. each of the people in the Bible have their children, you can work it out. The, the Jewish calendar is 5777 this year, yeah. 5,777 years old. It is the only 
uh, history of the world that makes any sense and is in harmony with the Bible. And I've got a three metre chart of all those genealogies. I can say it with absolute certainty. So uh, are you saying then basically um, that those evangelicals who deny that the Bible teaches the earth is less than 6,000 years old, they're just um, denying it because they're scared of science and scientists? Oh, um, the <laughs> he keeps on referring to me as a heretic. Uh, there are people who aren't heretics, who don't believe the Bible, don't believe the Christian, um, don't believe that the virgin birth, don't believe uh, a lot of the things here. I'm happy to be a heretic because everything I believe, I establish on scripture oh. and only scripture. Oh. And if I don't know, I'm going to say I don't know. Okay. Uh, but it's an understanding of scripture. So, uh, there is no doubt that there are many uh, scientists who accept what they call uh, intelligent design. Okay. But there are many religionists yeah. who think, oh, we can have evolution and Christianity. Yeah. You cannot have the two. Okay. Would you like to comment? Okay, he said that what he believes doesn't go against science. He just shows that it does. Because science doesn't believe what the Bible says. So either science is true, which we can empirically kind of I test. I didn't say... I. You did. You said you said it. You said the test. Your science. You test the science or something. Are you talking about prophecies? What do you say science for then? Okay. Science not through prophecy. Uh, because science says that we evolved. Yeah, but science. There are many religionists who say we evolved yeah. many christians who say we evolved but science says the universe is not more than six, or the earth sorry is older than six thousand years and it's kind of empirically proven yeah. it with, well, with, uh, with this experiment i so, do not take my source of information from scientists so you don't take um, empirical evidence tests and things like this against yeah. your bible you cannot test right. the world being millions of years old really you, you, how do you go out of there and say okay when was this created well when it you find a dinosaur even, bone how do you test it you say dinosaurs what the earth six thousand years ago sorry are you aware that they will burn a piece of wood in the 1800s, do some carbon dating, and end up with a thousand-year-old piece of wood? Did dinosaurs exist in the time Sorry, of Abraham? Sorry, my question was, are you aware that carbon dating is unreliable? No, I can accept that, but I'm asking okay, you a simple question. You. Yes, I am aware. You believe dinosaurs existed? Yes. Okay, do you believe they existed in the time of Noah? Yes. you believe dinosaurs went on the ark? Uh, I'm not sure. Well, if they existed, where'd they go? Oh, they, they got left off the ark. Um, I, I said, I said I don't know. Oh, fair enough. Okay. All right. All right. Then um, a, a question for the brother there. Then you and a last question for you. That's uh, uh, the last three questions, and that's it. We're done. Okay. Oh, you're stretching me here. Guys, <laughs> Can we have some quiet, please? Um, the ones going back to um, the verse in the Bible, which you found earlier on, when Hamza came back and made some points about um, why that verse seems as though it was emphasising the time of the people then, by right, the, the building and you know um, the, 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 um, the, pe the panel, right? You've not said why you believe it to be contrary to that. <coughs> and another okay. one as well. The other question is mm -hmm. right. Was there another prophet that was on earth the same time as Jesus? John the Baptist. Okay, did he worship Jesus? Uh, he, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. A few um, days, months later, he says, Are you the one? Um, did he worship Jesus? I don't remember him particularly worshipping Jesus. So, if there was another prophet in the time of Jesus, don't you think he should have worshipped Jesus? Um, not necessarily. It was pre-existed. Uh, in that John the Baptist is saying, are you the one? He doesn't know. So, what, um, what's the purpose of prophets? Don't they come to teach the people how to live? How, was to John the Baptist a prophet? You just you said he was. was. Yeah. Does the Quran say he was? You get the Quran. You We're just said he again. was. Yes. So, John the Baptist is a prophet. Is Jesus a prophet? Isa? Yes. Right. So, if Isa comes um, and he's a human being, are prophets supposed to know everything? John can only worship him if he knows everything. When he's asking, are you the one? Um, it's a big clearly, thing not to know, though. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> it's not important. Oh, no, this is my conversation, please. No, no, yeah, okay. no. Yeah, but but, but, but can right. we just let him answer and yeah, then let him answer, he's, please? He's so right. we can get to the last two questions. But if he comes as a human being, and he wants to show people how to live, and he wants to um, pay the, the penalty for sin. His purpose isn't, I am God. His purpose is, this is how you live, and worship the Father. That was the, the main purpose of his, his um, time on earth.
Uh, Carlton so, Time. Yes, he's right. Uh, Hamza, your, your oh, question. Okay, okay. Very, very good question, by the way, mashallah, about John the Baptist and that. Okay. <sighs> okay. So, John the Baptist is a prophet. Yeah, he doesn't, he's not told that Jesus is God, or he doesn't know Jesus is God, or has been informed Jesus is God. But fair enough. Okay. But then we know, we do know that John does declare him this, and the, the dove descends and all this business, yeah? So, why then doesn't he worship him? That's the question that needs to be asked, because you can hide behind the fact John didn't know. But John confessed. He said, this is the guy, this is the Lamb of God and takes away the sins of the world. Why didn't he worship them? Because now he, he is aware of who he is. I'm glad you asked the question. May I answer? Uh, can I get to you one second as well? Sure. Okay. Now, another thing to be brought up about the story of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was doing what? Baptising for the forgiveness of sin. Why did Jesus go to be baptised if he has no sin? Anyway, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll, really, I'll, I'll answer both questions. Yeah, sorry, really uh, question. Answer them, and then it's right. the last two questions, and then it's the conclusions, and we're done. Then okay. you, you can answer this. So, um, the, the second one why would Jesus baptized? Jesus was baptized as an example to everyone who uh, wants to follow him. Um, baptism represents the old sinful person dying and being raised as a new person. Um, so, it's just as an example to everyone who wants to be like him. The first one, um, John the Baptist. Oh yeah. So, so why didn't John? The why did John the Baptist not know? <clears throat> no, no. Why didn't he worship when he found out? When yeah. he realised? Yeah. So, the first thing he says was, "Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world." But when you are a prophet, and you're in prison, um, and the other prophet is out there and he's doing nothing about it, you're bound to think, "I don't get it. Why isn't he doing something about me?" Few people understood Christ, I would say no one understood what Christ came to do and that he was going to die. They all thought he's going to establish um, his kingdom and overthrow the Romans, including John the Baptist. So when, when, he's, in, uh, when, so when he's in prison, um, he's expecting to be delivered. He's not delivered. Is it not natural for a human being to think, are you the one? I don't think that's unreasonable. Okay, you next and your question last. Um, oh. This question is for both of you. Um, I'll ask you first because uh, I want to clarify the point. Um, I'm not sure if I'm, I heard it incorrectly, but you mentioned um, when I posed my question something in regards to um, verses from the Quran uh, about there being verses in the Quran that you, you should believe in the Bible. Um, is this true and could you give the evidence of this? <coughs> yeah, I think um, most of Surah 2. No, a lot of Surah 2 um, talks about... Uh, okay, so 2, 40 and 41. O children of Israel, call to mind my favour which I bestowed on you, and be faithful to your covenant with me. I will fulfil my covenant with you and of me, me alone, should you be afraid. And believe in what I have revealed, verifying that which is with you. Um, so if the, it's verifying the, that which the Jews had um, and in two, Surah 265 and certainly you've known those among you who exceeded the limits of the Sabbath so he's even talking about the Sabbath um, we most certainly gave Musa the book and we set apostles after him one after another we gave Isa the son of Maryam clear arguments and strengthened him with the Holy Spirit uh, is that enough? And so then there came to them a book from Allah verifying that which they have, um, 289, and I mean there are, there okay. are very, very many. Right. Would you like to comment? Yeah, so basically what he's just quoted from Surah Baqarah is that we know Musa Islam was given revelation, we know Isa Islam was given revelation, and then the, they're being reprimanded saying, look, now this has come along, confirming what was happened previously. Yeah, that, that's basically all it's saying. Yeah. What now happened? I, now I give Carlton... So what happened? What do you mean? You said what happened previously, not what was given in terms of books. I said what revelation? Look, don't think Jesus was walking around with a Bible, yeah? Or New Testament or anything of that sort. So not he New was Testament. Preaching, he was preaching the gospel. Okay. Now what that was, we don't know whether it was in written form or... My was question just was, uh, no, listen, what happened? Now first thing, we know the gospel of Q. You said what happened. The Quran says the book, the book that was given to them. You're making it simply what happened. The book was given to them, what the Quran says. Which book? The book of the Jews, i.e. the Old Testament. No, it says Moses was given a book. Yes. Yes. And it says Jesus was given revelation. Yes. And it says now this book has been revealed. Yes. 
I, I don't understand your question. Anyway, yeah. I don't want to go off point. This Sorry. is my question answer. You did. You went off oh, point by I'm saying what happened. Yeah. Like, can you finish his answer before you yeah. uh, cross it? That's why I interrupted okay. to say okay. what happened. No, no. <laughs> I'm referring to what I said earlier in my opening statement. Yeah. I said to you, let's just say, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had hold of the King James Bible as you read it, and got and Allah says, read the King James Bible. Yeah. So we've done that today. We've opened it. We want to see why you say Jesus is God. This was the whole topic of the, the whole point of the night is Jesus God. And I've give you, I've not even took anything. The New Testament is there in front of us. Yeah. You can't even find it. All you've done is onto revelations. You've ignored everything Jesus taught. You've not used anything of what he said. You've just gone to re this dream. Yeah. So yeah. I even give you. So that verse in the, um, what you're trying to refer to in the Quran or what was this? I said to you, even if it's the King James Bible, you still can't find what you're fishing for. It isn't there. That's why we're questioning you. What, what, why what you he says was, it makes no sense. You didn't understand this. Uh, we had 20 minutes. I decided to go for the account in the book of Revelation, which made no sense to you. So you've been uh, arguing about something which makes no sense instead of understanding what I said and addressing that. No. There were many other things I could have said, but haven't okay. on this particular occasion. I can occasion. only deal with uh, what, final comment. Yeah, I sure. Can only, I can only but, you, deal. but it makes no sense. So you can't deal with it. I can't deal with it. Because I can say why it makes no sense. Because I told you, yeah. I was dealing from a logical point of view. And I, I'm trying to find out, is Jesus God? I've told you, we, Jesus chose 12 men to walk with him, listen to his parables, witness his miracles. These, these are the people who will know Jesus and what he came for and what he said and what he did. Yeah, and I said to you, show us from any of the, these people's uh, writings, even if they, I'm even giving you saying they wrote it. We, we don't even know that. Anyway, you couldn't do it. And what made no sense is you ignored the walking, talking, historical Jesus, who went for all that problem, healing the sick, curing the blind, went on the cross, all of this business. You completely ignored all of that and you went to a dream. The, and, you, you, and what made no sense to me logically is why you ignored all of that and went to a dream. Right, that time. was made no sense. Time. Last and final question before the conclusions. Okay. Uh, can, thank yeah, you two minutes conclusions. This is, uh, uh, one it must be quite difficult right. to do. I want to say I get the mic ready. Right. Okay. Thank you once again. Um, it must be quite a long session and might be quite difficult. I, the, the question I have actually is to do with a mechanism for achieving salvation, which is really what we're all here to do, to give each other our ideas of what is the best way to achieve salvation. Uh, so we, the reason for here, we're here is actually because we <coughs> care about each other, ultimately. Um, so the question that I have is, the mechanism, as, as, as I understand, from your perspective, is uh, God became a, a human being, and a human sacrifice was made to pay for sin, which you said was only within this world. Um, in Islam, we have a, a straightforward, I would I would say, system of dealing with our sin, in that we believe in a creator who actually can forgive your sin and will accept your repentance when you give it to him sincerely. Um, this is echoed in Ezekiel 18.20, uh, the very, the almost identical mechanism of achieving uh, your rightness with God and, and achieving salvation. The problem that I see as a Muslim when I'm dealing with the Christian or your concept of um, how sin is dealt with is that you take an individual who you say led an, an, uh, an exemplary life, a perfect life, and then he is required to be killed for the, the sin of the people to be paid for. The problem with that specifically is that actually it seems unjust. It, unjust in the sense that I cannot think of any time where it's just to kill an innocent man. So that's the question I'd put to you. Is it ever right to kill an innocent man? Um. <laughs> The answer to is it ever right to kill an innocent man is no, unless the person offers themselves. So there have been accounts of um, people taking the penalty for other people. So if someone threatened my child and says, you need to die, uh, and I could die on behalf of my son, I would do that. So Christ wasn't uh, reluctant. Oh, no, I, I don't want to do this. In fact, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, if, if it's possible, if there's some other way, let this cup pass mm -hmm. from me. He was a genuine human and didn't really want to die, but he knew, not my will, thine be done. So he willingly sacrificed his life, even though uh, the human part of him says, uh, you know, the, I don't want to go through this. Uh, I, I need help. And of course, it isn't something, oh, do, 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 uh, let me just go and uh, kill myself. This was something that took 
a lot of courage and sacrifice. And he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done, because he wanted to do what the Father needs to be best, and what he also wanted to do. In other words, to, it was the only chance that any of us had to live eternally. So um, he was killed because it's called a sacrifice. They couldn't touch him um, if he didn't allow them to. Okay, final comment, and then there's two minutes conclusions each, and we're done. Okay, the question asks, is, is it okay to kill someone innocent? So when Abraham was going to sacrifice uh, his son, um, was his son innocent? Uh, obviously he was, and yet God was telling him to do it. So don't quite, he wasn't voluntary. The Quranic version... It doesn't make any sense, does it? No, I'll tell you why it doesn't. Because in the Quran, it's a beautiful story where... Um, Ab um, I, well, I'm not going to say Ishmael, I'm going to say his son because I don't want to get into that debate. His son says to his father what's wrong and he tells him what his dream he's had and, and um, his son comforts him and says, Look, this is God's will, let's do it, such and such. The Bible version... <laughs> um, they're going to, uh, Abraham says to his son, come on, let's go um, uh, up and do a sacrifice. And... Um, his son's like, um, but where's the, where's the sacrifice? He goes, oh, uh, don't worry, um, God. God will provide. Um, and then he, um, cause he's basically he <coughs> lies to his son. Yeah, that he. How is it a lie? Because he's going to sacrifice him. So how is it a lie? God will provide, and does God provide? Yeah, but how does Abraham know that? Ah. Anyway, good. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to comment on good, that. Good, good, good. All right. So uh, the po the point here, what? Um, oh, that's the point there. While they're finding it, it's the same reason why John says, "Behold, the Lamb of God." Sorry, sorry. Let me read the story. One second. Let me remind <coughs> myself. Um, I'll remind you quickly. You're about to come out with, yeah, and yeah. Abraham told his son that God will provide a lamb, and then uh, yeah. he basically lied to his son. That's what you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he, he, he think he did okay. then he tied him up. Uh -huh. It wasn't voluntary, and Jesus wasn't uh, obviously like he said. He he wasn't willing to go through it. Now, I, another thing comes out of here. Did Jesus know he was God? Because if Jesus is supposed to be God, and yet now he's just talking about his human side, and all of a sudden now there's a divine side now. Now we just thought that Jesus was just a, just a man. Now all of a sudden he's got two natures going on here. <coughs> this didn't make no sense. And like I said, did Jesus have amnesia? Did, did he forget what the plan was? Because this was supposed to be the plan from the beginning of time, and all of a sudden now Jesus is saying, "Well, I don't really want to do this." And then even Jesus prayed, and according to Paul, his prayer was heard. And when prayer is heard, that means it's been answered. So if the if prayer was answered, then why was he uh, still had to go through with it? Okay. None, none of it makes sense. I'm not All right, then. Jazakallah for the beautiful questions. <laughs> so we're going to go straight to the conclusions, and then um, it'll be the end of the debate. Do you want to uh, summarize uh, your position for the uh, first two minutes? Okay. Just time um, to check the time. So, we've had an in interesting exchange. Uh, some of you will have learnt nothing at all from, from what I said. Um, that's, uh, that's unfortunate. Um, I'm not expecting you to believe uh, what I say. I'm expecting you to go and look at what I say. Um, my explanation was, he existed before. Um, he became a human being. He walked upon the earth. There is no doubt that you support that he was a human being on earth. Our difference is, what about Jesus before he became a human being and after he rose from the dead? That is something that you need to decide for yourselves because we are agreed, while on earth, he was 100% human being. What are you thinking about me raising the question about before he became a human being? You need to think about that. You need to satisfy yourself that you have appropriate answers. Similarly, uh, if in the book of Revelation chapter 1, and I'm really sorry I couldn't show you the words because it's a little bit easy to understand what I was saying. Had you seen the words and been able to uh, compare them to what Ezekiel saw, because they both saw the same thing. Um, now, Hamza, uh, my uh, good friend, didn't understand the purpose of that. I apologize, but the important thing for you is to go back and see if reading chapter 1, you can understand what I was trying to get across with. Not that you believe it, but at least understand what I was trying to say. Um, why didn't I talk about all the other things? Listen, we've been there before. We've had those arguments before. When he watches me on YouTube, 
Uh, it's because he wants to see what am I going to say. I am not interested in what he's saying. I'm interested only in truth. I do not need to prepare because this, I believe, is true. And when we have something that uh, has seen the test of time, has prophecies that we are seeing fulfilled in our lifetime, there is no doubt whatsoever yeah. that this is unlike any other time. book. And, oh, I thought you said two minutes. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, cool. two minutes. All right. yeah, it's two minutes altogether. Two minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. All right, then. God bless Final you. conclusions and then... Okay. Uh, uh, first, I'd like to apologise to Carl. Because you can take the, the boy out of speaker's corner, but you can't take speaker's corner out of the boy. So forgive me for that. I may have got a little bit robust with you, and I do apologise for that. Um, okay. So what did I do today? I asked a question, and I, I accepted that, you know, there are heresies, and I don't really need to challenge each individual heretical belief. But I'm challenging Christians now, you, you guys watching at home here. You've seen this. You, you, the claim is Jesus is God. And I've challenged you. Open up your scriptures. Open up your New Testament. Show me. Show me a, a, where you get this belief from. Because we, Carlton here couldn't find it. Now, either he couldn't find it or wouldn't find it. I'm not sure. He says, oh, he's done it before. Now, does that mean he's been refuted before? I don't know. Why do I watch these things on YouTube? It makes, it makes common sense. And this is common sense. And I've used this word again, common sense. To know who you're dealing with. What they're debating here, what their angles are, what they think, how they think, what, what heretics they are, or are they mainstream Christians? Are they Jehovah's Witnesses? Are they Seventh-day Adventists? I don't know, so I need to watch and see what he's doing. I'm pretty sure he must have watched my, some of my YouTube videos as well. Not one. Not oh, one. Very good. Absolutely nuts. <laughs> I, I, I thought that. I wondered why he didn't cancel. Anyway, so, <laughs> so basically, to conclude very, very quickly, um, is that... I presented today here as agnostic, not as a Muslim. I, there were no Islamic uh, perspectives on this. I just wanted purely why does someone should believe Jesus is God? So some poor innocent guy in the street and a Christian walks up and says, you need Jesus. Jesus says Jesus is God. I want them to be say to ask this question. Why do you say Jesus is God? Show me in your scriptures why you believe Jesus is God. And let's test that. And then we'll see truly whether he is or not. And when you realize he's not, then come to the truth, which is Islam. Okay, then I'd like to thank all the brothers for attending. I'd like to thank Carlton for attending and Hamza and the London brothers. And may the peace and guidance of Allah be with us all. Inshallah. Amen.